Okay, so the main teaching point of this is that this is a presentation for a manic episode. Um, with a history of major depressive order, this reaches the criteria for a actual bipolar affective disorder rather than just a manic episode. Um, the difference between type 1 and type 2 bipolar affective disorder is the impairment on um, everyday function. So the fact that it's been going on for eight days and also because he's invested his savings into cryptocurrency makes it more of a type 1 presentation than a type 2. Um, if it was a type 2, uh, the a type 2 question will come, so it's okay. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so the answer is bipolar affective disorder type one. All right, good job, everyone. I don't think we really need to explain this question since most people got grandiose dilution. Um, yep, next one. Oh, is this one teaching? Um, good job, everyone. So that was inattention type. Um, most people got the right answer, but some things that point you towards that answer in the STEM is that um, the patient is a girl. So um, young girls usually present with inattention type for ADHD. There aren't really any hyperactivity symptoms. It's mostly inattention type symptoms. All right, good job. So the answer to this question is sertraline. Um, sertraline just has the best uh, adverse effect profile or sort of, so it's the one that's recommended in an increased cardiovascular risk. Um, mirtazapine 
it, and venlafaxine and raboxetine are not as recommended venlafaxine and raboxetine especially because they're snris um but yeah Is the action that's fine. Because I always mix it up with tiramisu. Um, yeah, so the answer was B. Um, he was started on an antidepressant, and um, I think what we were trying to assess was um, the knowledge that with Maui inhibitors, you have to li limit your tiramine. Um, so he hasn't limited his tyramine and he's now presenting with a hypertensive crisis. Um, so the answer will be B, moclobemide. All right, so the right answer to this question was clozapine. Um, and the biggest hint in this stem is that Jack tried two previous um, agents that didn't work. So he started on olanzapine um, and then he tried risperidone and both of them uh, didn't end up fixing all the positive symptoms, which is why he's eligible to start clozapine. Um, a few people chose aripiprazole, which is probably the second best answer in this case, but the question was mostly testing on um, the fact that you could start to uh, clozapine after failing two agents. Um, I think aripiprazole for the people that chose it may have been chosen for the side effects profile, which is usually what would happen in real life. But in this case, um, it doesn't look like his side effects were too bad. So that's why clozapine would be the best answer.
Um, good job, everyone. So what we're testing here is um, differentiating between normal grief reaction and major depressive disorder. So the DSM removed it recently, but there was for a while, it was that you couldn't diagnose major depressive disorder within two months of um, a major traumatic event. Um, and the also, the other differentiating factor is the fact that self-esteem was preserved. So if this person had major depressive disorder, um, they would have more, I guess, negative cognitive thoughts rather than he just feels empty without his wife. Um, and with grief reactions as well, you can definitely get auditory hallucinations in, in older people. Um, so yeah, the the answer is normal grief reaction. Um, so for this question, um, acute meltdown prevention in children diagnosed with ADHD is, um, is with an antipsychotic regimen and 0 0.5 milligrams once daily is usually what they do. Um, in terms of continued verbal de-escalation, I think that was the one that we thought was going to trip everyone up, but, um, that's already been trialed and then applied behavioral analysis. I don't, um. Do you have any thoughts? No. <laughs> I don't really know. Um, so yeah, it's it's like it's risperidone. Um, good job, everyone. Oxazepam is definitely the way to go here. I think um, we usually with a lot of other questions, if the flight had been in, say, three months, CBT would be first line. But because Emily is on a flight in two days and, yeah, she'll need oxazepam.
Um, okay, so the answer for that was Alzheimer's with a major as a major neurocognitive disorder. Um, the the biggest giveaway in this question was the decline in function. So um, major and minor neurocognitive disorder aren't really separated by a specific MMSE number or grade, but it's more about their ADLs. So he has declined in his ability to live independently, which classifies it as a major neurocognitive disorder. Um, good job, everyone. I think this was pretty straightforward for most people. Um, the main thing about delusional disorder is that it doesn't have any major functional impairments. So the fact that she's maintained her job, continues to interact with her family despite having these um, like outlandish beliefs, um, points you more in the direction of delusional disorder rather than a schizophrenia or a schizoaffective disorder. Good job, everyone. Um, most people got a granulocytosis, which is sort of buzzwordy for clozapine. Um, don't think it's particularly nephrotoxic, and it does, uh, and the arrhythmia and thyrotoxicity um, is not as concerning as a granulocytosis. Um, good job. So that was vascular dementia. Um, the, the disinterest in the hobbies and being withdrawn is sort of more connected to 
the symptoms of dementia rather than a major depressive disorder. Um, and there is an impairment of MMSE as well as a lot of um, ischemic sort of risk factors with the hypertension and the type 2 diabetes. Um, so there is probably pointing towards more of a vascular dementia than a major depressive disorder sort of picture. You know, like, he posts videos of like people giving birth on his Instagram, and like you can see the kids and everything. And then, um, <laughs> yeah, and then the comments will be like, "Thank you so much, Charlie. You had the best birth." And I was like, "You're a victim." <laughs> yeah. Then thank him. You're a victim. <laughs> Um, so with this question, um, Rabia has anorexia nervosa, nervosa um, and it's quite buzzwordy, actually. It's a really long question, but it's quite buzzwordy for anorexia. Um, and the therapy for that is family-based therapy rather than family therapy. I think someone told me this, that family therapy is when you get a family together. Is that not what family-based therapy is as well? I don't know. Anyways, it's family-based therapy. <laughs> Yep, so the answer was agoraphobia. Um, yeah, Tom just doesn't want to get out of the house due to anxiety, and that is what agoraphobia is. Um, so the aunt, so Fung is a 24 year old female who presents with low mood. Um, so she has seasonal affective disorder. Um, and so that's a subtype of major depressive disorder. This is because she's been feeling sad around the time that she's presenting for the past four years. And it usually resolves within two months without intervention. Seasonal affective disorder usually follows the same seasonal patterns and also the same seasonal resolutions as well. Um, there's no indication that she feels um, low any time outside of these years. And yeah, so that is seasonal affective disorder, MDD. Um, I think we thought that persistent depressive disorder was going to be a big um, toss up, which it was, but it turns out everything else was as well. Um, so C, major depressive disorder.
um, good job. So most people got tired of dyskinesia. Um, the other ones that people chose were dystonia and akinesia. Both of these are more acute. So this patient has been on antipsychotics for the past 20 years. Dystonia and akinesia sort of happen in the first couple of days or weeks of starting a new antipsychotic medication. So, um, and also the movements in this question are very classic for tardive dyskinesia. Dystonia is more of an abnormal posture and akinesia is sort of a motor restlessness. Do you think I have a fuck issue? I feel like I do, like... Yeah, but that's just like a little... Um, that's correct. So normal aging is the right answer. Um, by the way, if you didn't already figure out, NESB stands for non-English speaking background. Um, so there's not really anything here that's pointing to something particularly pathological. Um, and she lives independently at home and she's caring from someone else. So nothing really pointing towards anything other than normal aging. I feel like you shouldn't go into the middle. So we mean Um, so the answer for this question was ECT, and one of the main reasons is because this patient is refusing to eat or drink, so it would be um, difficult to give them clozapine or lanzapine PO. Um, you could make the argument that you could give the, to them IM, but that would have a lot of ethical issues. Um, and then also the fact that he has lost 12 kilograms for, of weight from his baseline um, means that this is quite an acute presentation. Um, so ECT would be the best option in this case. Um, also with the known history of heart disease, clozapine and the lanzapine aren't the best options.
this I haven't done psych in six months, but I'm working. It's good to break So for children presenting with depression, um, this is a 13-year-old girl presenting with low mood, anhedonia, suicidal ideation. Um, so definitely depression. Um, but the most important strategy is usually not um, pharmacological. So in this case, cognitive behavioral therapy would be first line. And if she had not done well with CBT, then we would probably try fluoxetine. But um, CBT would be first line. Um, usually if they want you to answer fluoxetine, they will say previous attempts at engaging in CBT or therapy was unsuccessful. Um, so what this question is alluding to is Dylan is using drugs. Um, so <laughs> He's always been well behaved, gets good grades, gets good grades at school, and then returned from a camping trip with his friends with an acute change in behavior. So this is most likely drug induced psychosis, and for this we'd want to order our baseline bloods, FE, UEC, LFT, TFT, urine drug screen, and an ECG. Um, even though the question is alluding to it, it's important to first confirm this diagnosis. And I don't think that in any case, commencing an antipsychotic or an antidepressant first would be um, appropriate without um, any more information. So yes, most people got A, which is correct. So the answer for this question was rivastigmine. Um, it's the first line medication for Alzheimer's disease. And in this um, specific scenario, she has a Lewy body, which rivastigmine is effective for. Um, in terms of antipsychotics, um, oh, I think people may have been tripped up with the fact that she was having visual hallucinations, um, but she doesn't have any of the other criteria for, um, for schizophrenia for example. Um, so in this case, the visual hallucinations were an indication that it was Lewy body dementia. Um, and so in that case, river sigmine would be the correct answer.
Um, for this patient, you really wouldn't choose haloperidol because she has that rigidity in her upper limb. So you don't want to be up maximizing the APSCs. Um, yeah, so the question was, I mean, the answer was ECT. Um, she's got psychotic depression, and that's pretty much one of the main indications for ECT. She's still catatonic, actively suicidal, and have trialed oral medications. Um, the fact that she, it's an acute, um, it's an acute suicidality as well will also point you towards ECT, which most people were pointed towards. So good job. Oh. I mean him, he was a male. <laughs> Okay, so the answer to this question was sodium. So um, for the side effects of lithium, the acronym is lithium R and the I stands for insipidus. So um, lithium is very uh, notorious for causing high hyponatremia. So potassium is, oh, not potassium, so sodium is the thing that you want to monitor all the time. Um, the other I electrolytes, might be affected by lithium, but sodium is the buzzwordy one. Um, so most people got this question right. It's obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Um, I think the main difference between obsessive compulsive disorder and OCPD is the fact that um, OCPD is ego syntonic whereas OCD is ego dystonic. So if this patient was presenting with OCD, they'd be a lot more distressed and, um, and not wanting to do what they are doing rather than OCPD where he feels like he's right in every scenario. Thank you. 
So that's correct. The answer is schizophrenia. Um, I think it's important in this case to know that if in a presentation that is um, like that feels like depression, it could also be prodromal symptoms for schizophrenia. Um, and so he's developed his psychosis and the timeline also links up with schizophrenia. So this is a pretty bread and butter, bread and butter schizophrenia. Good job, everyone. So if you remember in psych, there's that um, pyramid and the top thing that you always look at is organic um, causes. So this person, if you didn't think that this was a psych question, you'd think that she has thyrotoxicosis and she does. Um, so that's the first thing that you will look out for. Um, so good job. The answer was D. Um, usually the acute management would be fecal Im disimpaction um, with laxatives. Um, but routine fecal disimpaction isn't really recommended in anchoparesis due to um, like there are just better options. And then for long-term steroid, I mean, laxative use, you would be worried about dehydration. Um and so, yeah, that would make D the best answer. With diet modification to include a fiber-rich diet, I think that would be a bit more difficult in kids. So I'm not saying that that's wrong, but I'm, I think D would be the better answer in this case. Probably don't need to explain this one since 
almost everyone got delirium. Um, it's a very acute presentation and he's disorientated and it's post-surgery. So delirium, delirium is the most likely answer here. <laughs> All right, good job. So I think most people picked out that this patient is presenting with neuroleptic malignant syndrome. So you see that by the fever, the hemodynamic instability. So they can be hypertensive. They can also be hypotensive um, and the tachycardia. But what mostly gives it away is the rigidity and the really high CK level. So um, serotonin syndrome can present very similarly with the fever and tachycardia and sort of that hemodynamic instability, but it won't have rigidity and an elevated CK. So the cause for this one is the only um, antipsychotic drug here, which is haloperidol. Um, I think that concludes all our questions for today. We're running a little bit early. So um, if anyone had any questions about any of the content we went through, we're very happy to answer them now. Um, otherwise, good job. Cool. So why, while Emil is getting that set up, um, thanks all for having us today. I'm Georgia and I'm Mo from MoGig. I was the chair this year. Um, and I'm joined by Mark, who is my academic vice chair this year as well. Um, so yeah, hopefully this gives you guys a bit of a hand with OMG. I know it's notoriously a pretty terrifying exam to sit, but you will all get through it. We all got through it. Um, yeah, it's just a little bit rough in the meantime while you're learning, but hopefully this gives you a little bit of confidence after today. Um, and then click onto the next slide of the presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Cool. So it seems like pretty much everyone got the answer correct for this one. So B, these are consistent with benign nuth bolt. Oh my goodness, I can't speak. Nabatholian follicles. So this kind of characteristic appearance here of this sort of yellowy white cystic structure is very characteristic of a nabatholian follicle. Um, it's not typically associated with any sort of HPV or cervical cancer um, related pathology. So yeah, this one was sort of one of those ones where they wanted you to know what the cause of it is. So it's the blocked ducts that contribute to it um, and it's not related to any sort of malignancy. Does anyone have any questions about that? Cool, let's move on then. Oops.
All right, a bit of a trickier one. I agree, <laughs> this question was a bit tricky. Um, so the correct answer in this instance was B. So from reading the stem, it sounds pretty characteristic of PCOS with those irregular periods, variable cycle length, um, and difficulties with becoming pregnant. So when you think about PCOS, we know the Rotterdam criteria. That's a very important thing for you to think about in your exams and know for your exams. It's fair game and you should know it back to front. Um, so we know that we can either have the irregular cycles, which we have in this case, and that we need one of two other criteria to diagnose it, which is either the ovarian findings on ultrasound, so lots of cysts, or we need evidence of hyper um, androgenism. So looking at testosterone or clinical features of high testosterone. So typically hirishism or like hair is more suggestive of PCOS than just acne or sort of hair loss. It's something to do with sort of the testosterone axis, but essentially hirishism is sort of more of an indicative symptom than just acne or female pattern hair loss, if that makes sense. With the LH to FSH ratio, which a few people put, we see a spike in LH in people with PCOS. So we would expect a higher LH to lower FSH, if that makes sense, because your LH is feeding back to negatively inhibit your FSH production. So with normal testosterone and free testosterone, I feel like that one's pretty straightforward. Most people who have PCOS have higher levels of testosterone, which leads to their symptoms. And then with a BMI of less than 18, we would normally expect someone with PCOS to have um, that metabolic syndrome and a higher BMI rather than a lower BMI. Does that all make sense to everyone or any burning questions? Cool. All right, let's move on then. Yeah, I've just got a message in the chat. Can you please explain the LH to FSH ratio again? So in PCOS, the pathology is typically caused by people having very high LH. So their pituitary is secreting lots and lots of LH. And because of that, the LH negatively feedbacks to the pituitary to reduce FSH. So that's why if we're thinking about the ratio, if we have a higher ratio of LH to FSH, we're going to have more LH compared to FSH. And in this question, we've got more FSH, so the three compared to the one, which is the LH. Does that answer your question? No stress, cool. So this one is also a tricky one. I really struggled last year to get my mind all around moles and partial versus complete. Um, I think it's one of those things, unfortunately, just to kind of learn before your exam. And then it's something you can always look up in the future. But in this instance, we'll run through the answers. So the correct answer in this instance was B. So a complete mole presents with a snowstorm appearance on ultrasound while a partial mole does not. So the snowstorm appearance, whenever you hear that, it's sort of a bit buzzwordy for a complete mole um, rather than a partial mole. So just kind of tuck that one away as a clinical pearl. When you hear snowstorm, think of complete mole. Um, in terms of the other answers, A is incorrect um, because a partial mole is a set of triploid chromosomes rather um, than a complete mole, which is diploid. So with kind of how a mole comes about, a partial mole is when you have one, so the female egg divides normally 
but the sperm has two sets of chromosomes, so it doesn't split its chromosomes in half normally. So you end up with a triploid set of chromosomes because you have two lots of the male and one lot of the female. Whereas when you have a complete mole, there's no chromosomes that have ended up in the OSI and only sort of a double set of paternal chromosomes, if that makes sense. Um, moving on to option C, um, a complete mole is associated with the presence of fetal tissue while an incomplete mole has no fetal tissue. It's the other way around in that instance. Um, and a complete mole is triploid, whereas a partial mole is diploid. Again, other way around, um, because again, you're thinking about where those chromosomes have come from. And then E, a partial mole often leads to metastasis, whereas a complete mole rarely does. So a complete mole is more likely to become metastatic compared to a partial mole. It's just something about the statistics of it all. Um, subtle plug, but also have to plug it. Um, we've got some good summaries on our Mumus subcommittee's drive um, about mole and the different types of molar pregnancies. If you find this stuff confusing like I did and you just want to look over some stuff and comparison tables to get your head around things. Cool. Road to number one. I feel like this is a very classic ONG question because they give you like so many options and all of them or half of them are pretty reasonable and what you think should be the answer. But then they get you with like sort of a very technical like reason as to why the correct answer is the answer. So a lot of the questions in ONG this year that you guys will have, it'll be emphasizing what the best next step is. And that was something that I kind of struggled to get my head around the lead up to the exams last year. So something that I found quite helpful when I was thinking about questions and what sort of the next best step is, because that's in this instance what you're being asked, is thinking about, all right, do I have all the information? Is there anything more that I need to know before I can make a decision? Because I feel like obstetricians are very, I need all of the information and all of the picture before I decide what to do. So I don't know if that'll help you guys in narrowing down what the best next step is in questions like this when a few of them sound reasonable. So in this instance, the answer was D, perform an ultrasound. So I can see that quite a few people put C, which is the correct medical treatment um, for an unwanted pregnancy to induce a termination. Um, but in this instance, there's a couple of key bits of information that you're missing. So first off, you need to confirm that she's actually pregnant before you book her in for a medical termination. You also need to confirm how far along the pregnancy is because that's going to determine whether or not you can give medical versus surgical. And you also need to confirm the location of the pregnancy. So all three of those things you need to figure out before you counsel her on um, medical versus surgical management. So in this instance, the best next step is to perform an ultrasound, which will give you all of that information. Does that all make sense? Cool. All right. If not, just shout out and I can talk about it more, but we'll move on.
right. You guys were very good at this question. So well done. Um, I can see a few people thought vaginitis and a few people thought vulvo vaginal lichen planus. So in these instances, the reason they're probably not correct is vaginitis is like that inflammatory sort of irritation of the vagina and the vulva. In this instance, the fact that the skin appears smooth, shiny, and it's sort of, you know, loss of rugae, that's sort of more consistent with something that's not inflammatory, if that makes sense. So for vulva vaginitis, we'd expect something that's like red, irritated, raised, maybe a couple of splits in the skin or something like that. So that's kind of pointing us away from vaginitis or some sort of inflammatory or localized irritation. In terms of why this is vulva vaginal atrophy, the fact that she's perimenopausal, she's having these recurrent urinary tract infections, the poor libido and dyspareunia, that all kind of points towards someone who's kind of he headed towards the more menopausal side of perimenopause. And the fact that the skin is sort of smooth, shiny, and there's loss of typical architecture, that's sort of more similar with and with the recurrent urinary tract infections that's more indicative of vulvovaginal atrophy rather than lichen planus. So I wonder if maybe some of the people who put lichen planus got lichen planus and lichen sclerosis mixed up a little bit. Very easy to do. I see doctors do it every day. Um, so it's important to remember lichen planus is the red kind of inflammation changes in the skin. Whereas vulvovaginal lichen sclerosis is the pallor and the loss of the architecture and things like that. So just really have them differentiated in your mind and like a very clear picture of which one's which because they're very easy to mix up. They've got very similar names. Um, does anyone have any questions about this one? Amazing. All right, I'll pass it on to Mark for the next few questions. Cool. Georgia, would it be okay if you drive the screen for me? Yeah, sure. Thank Just you. let me know. Um, awesome. So let's do the next question. Um, uh, this is question six. So this is a question, um, a little bit of pharmacology, but it was actually on the Moodle site. So I think it is relevant um, under menopause and osteoporosis. So it's a question about pharmacology. Okay, awesome. Um, looks like most people got this one right. Um, so the answer is uh, to peritide. Um, and this is because the question asks, which is the agent that both inhibits osteoclasts, but also activates osteoblasts? The only one that does this is to peritide. Um, so just as a refresh, uh, to peritide is a PTH analog. Um, it acts by uh, inhibiting osteoclasts, but also acts by stimulating bone formation um, by turning on osteoclasts. Uh, a and E are incorrect because they're both uh, bisphosphonates. Um, B is incorrect because um, this is a, it works through a different mechanism. Um, and three is uh, C is desnuzumab. Sorry. And this is a monoclonal antibody, so it has a different mechanism. So well done, everyone that got that one right. I think that's a probably a lower yield question, but I think that that's the kind of question they could ask to sort of separate the cohort a little bit. Um, next question, please, Georgia.
people. Uh, well done, everyone. Um, the answer is C. So I think most people got that. Um, and that's because in cases where it's a, um, a not a 16 or 18, which are the high risk strands, and you also have a negative LBC, you actually repeat the CST in 12 months. So it's worth, um, if this is a confusing area, this is quite high yield, I think, for the exam. So it's worth sort of memorizing being able to roughly draw out the flow chart. But it seemed like most people did really well on this. So great job. Okay, so it looks like it's a bit of a, uh, a tie between A and C, um, with most people saying A, which is correct. So um, this is a hard question. And to go back to what Georgia was saying, a lot of our exam was very um, finicky with the exact wording of things. So I would really encourage you when you do the ONG exam to be very careful and underline like every word. So this is a, a bit of a confusing one because it's like, which one is false? Um, so the one that is false is actually A, because most of the transmission um, for, for chlamydia doesn't actually happen while the, um, like in utero, it actually happens during the um, passage through the birth canal if the infection isn't treated. So um, that's why it was A. Um, a fair few people also said C. Um, and this um, was actually correct. Um, so in pregnancy, the antibody, um, sorry, the antibiotic of choice is actually going to be azithromycin one gram orally. Um, but in non-pregnant patients, it's doxycycline, which is not relevant for us. So the answer to this one is A. So well done to everyone who got that. Great, well done. Um, so the answer is B, which is a sister still, which I think everyone got. Um, and just to refresh on that, um, so the patient's um, 64 years old, she's had um, multiple pregnancies, and um, this is also, um, so a sister still is a prolapse of the bladder through the vagina. Um, as I said, it's associated with increased age and multiple pregnancies. Um, the fact that it changes with abdominal pressure supports that, as well as the increase in, um, in urinary frequency. Um, and also UTIs are also more common with, um, with a sister still as well. So it could explain some of her symptoms. So well done.
I'm loving how quickly these are all flying up. Everyone knows this one. <laughs> Great, well done. Um, so the correct answer is B, um, which is correct. And that's because uh, Jean has a sudden strong urge to urinate and is sometimes not able to reach the toilet in time. And the fact that she has frequent urination, even at night, uh, is aligned with this. Stress urinary incontinence, which is A, which a few people said, um, that is involved when, uh, with leakage when there's increased abdominal pressure, such as coughing, sneezing. Um, and I think the other one that some people said was C, which is a mixed picture, which would have both of those as well. So well done, everyone. I'll hand back over to Georgia. So this is our next question. Hopefully it's straightforward. <laughs> Incredible. So pretty much everyone got that all of these things can contribute to mortality, either for the mum or bub. Um, so yeah, just a lot can go wrong in pregnancy. And these are sort of some of the big risks. So yeah, I won't dwell too much because I feel like it's pretty straightforward. Um, but if anyone has any questions, feel free to interrupt me. I'll answer your question in a sec, Deanna. Great. So a lot of people were able to identify that C was the correct answer in this instance. Um, I might just ask a answer. Ugh, sorry, answer Deanna's question quickly. So I know that in some of the older exams, sort of before 2018-ish, um, you have the extended multiple choice questions. They actually don't have that format anymore for any of the exams you'll sit in fourth year. They're all A to E options, I believe, Mark. Um, correct me if I'm wrong and have blocked things out, but yeah, essentially A to E. So you won't be having those massive um, sort of, options that they give you in those. Um, I can see Julia's just asked me what's causing the bleeding between the periods in this instance. So I'll dip back to this question. In this instance, we've got a woman, she's sexually active, not using condoms consistently with partners, um, and she's got a new partner relatively recently. The three-day history of dysuria and increased vaginal discharge that's yellow and malodorous is very, very suggestive of an STI. She's got the sexually active risk factors and not using condoms consistently, and she's also sounding like she's got some sort of infection. So that automatically should put your blinkers up thinking that this is an STI. 
In terms of why she's bleeding kind of inconsistently between periods, like I understand, yes, that could be something going wrong with her ovaries or endometriosis or something like that. But in this instance, it sounds that it's happening sort of in more of an acute fashion since all these other symptoms have come on. And that can be a symptom of an STI as well. So that bleeding can just be sort of part of the STI and the inflammation that's manifesting within the vagina. So in terms of the management options, I can see most people got, we were going to do the endocycle swab, looking at chlamydia and gonorrhea, and then start her on some empirical treatment. So your keftriaxone IM is what covers your gonorrhea and your azithromycin, or in some cases, doxycycline is what's going to cover your chlamydia in most instances. So that's why we treat for both until we know which one it is we're dealing with. Um, I can see a few people put order rapid plasma reagent tests and prescribe empirical treatment with LIM keftriaxone. That's probably not going to be as good. So RPR, I believe, is for syphilis more than any of the other um, STIs. So that's not capturing the one that she's probably at risk for, which in most of our young people is going to be chlamydia and gonorrhea. And in the empirical treatment, we're also not covering for, um, for chlamydia. So yeah, in this instance, that's why C is right. Um, if we did suspect syphilis, would we do the blood test? Yes, we would do, I, we would probably do the blood test rather than the swab. Um, we'd probably do both in an ideal world. But in this instance, given her age and her risk factors, my red flags don't really go up for syphilis. I think as well, the symptoms she's describing are very indicative of either chlamydia or gonorrhea rather than syphilis, which would be more like a chancre if it's primary or all of those sort of systemic viral weird symptoms that are very vague. So in this instance, I think she's probably suggestive more of a gonorrhea or chlamydia picture. Please feel free to chime in if you have any extra comments, Mark. But cool. cool. Next question. All right. So most people were pretty strong on this answer. So whenever someone has any sort of incontinence picture, the first line things we always will do is do lifestyle intervention. So in this instance, she probably could lose a little bit of weight to help with um, her instance of like urinary incontinence. So we want to target that as much as we can. And we also want to reduce her caffeine because as you know, caffeine is a bladder irritant. So that's going to make her need to go to the toilet more often and exacerbate all those issues. All of the other options we could consider, um, but I think in this instance, it's often best to just start off with the easy stuff. Cool. So, George, this is one where maybe we could, before we press start, we could let everyone mm. these values because it's spread over two pages, unfortunately. I'm... Oh, is it? So, like, let, yeah, let everyone read it before we click next. Thanks, Mark. All right. We'll give everyone about 30 more seconds. And... Cool. Everyone's clear on the what the serology found? Beautiful. All right. I will... Maybe I'll see if I can... No, I can't.
This was a trickier one, um, but most people were able to find that A is the correct answer. So in this instance, this lady, if you aren't already sure of what the serology showed, I'm not sure if I can actually go back. I don't think I've got that capability, sorry. Um, but essentially her serology showed that she is a chronic hepatitis B um, infection. So in this instance, that's going to affect how we manage her in labour to prevent transmission to the fetus. So in this instance, we know that FSEs or scalp electrodes and scalp sampling are high risk procedures that can lead to the transmission of bloodborne viruses. So we want to avoid all of that as much as possible. With tenofovir, which a few people also picked, we only give that if, a, if the viral load hits above a certain threshold, which I think is 200,000. So in this instance, her viral load, I think, was about 10,000 from memory. It doesn't meet that criteria when we need to start antiretroviral therapy. Um, in terms of the cesarean section, we don't need to worry about that. She's still able to give birth with hepatitis B, um, get provided, I guess, that her um, viral load doesn't get too high. Um, she's allowed to breastfeed as well, if, as long as we manage the fetus and the newborn after birth and give them um, that immunoglobin that will help protect them from transmission. Um, and then we also don't need to administer the immunoglobin to the mother. We need to administer it to the fetus after birth. Oops. Okay. I think someone might have a question. <laughs> yeah. Mark's just put some good guidelines in the chat, but essentially for those who aren't on Zoom, um, they're RAMS called guidelines. Um, yeah. Just have a look at those. But otherwise, are there any burning questions about this question? One of those ones where you sort of just have to learn the management and the guidelines, unfortunately. Cool. All right, let's move on to the next one. This one's one you know or you don't. <laughs> Amazing. So most people picked toxoplasmosis, which was correct. A few people picked syphilis and HIV. So remember, if you think back to your initial booking where, you know, someone comes to you and they say, I'm pregnant, um, what are the routine tests we order? So we check for all of the, you know, blood group, FBE and all that stuff. But there's a few key conditions that we always check for because the risk of them going untreated or unmanaged in pregnancy is very significant. And can have some significant outcomes on the fetus that can be lifelong or life altering. So those ones that you want to think about are rubella. So all the concerns about deafness, all of the congenital syndromes and all of those things, rubella, we always will check whether someone is, um, oops, um, we always need to check whether someone's immunized for rubella. Important to remember though, we actually can't give the rubella vaccine when someone's pregnant because of the risk of seroconversion because it's a live attenuated version of the virus. So please, please, please remember, don't give a rubella injection um, or immunization in pregnancy. We just check to see that someone is immune. We also will always check their syphilis and their HIV. So remember, again, both these conditions, there's the risk of HIV transmission and there's extra steps we need to take in pregnancy and extra monitoring of the parent's viral load to make sure that we don't pass HIV onto the child. And we also need to make sure that the person doesn't have syphilis because of the significant congenital um, abnormalities that come along with that if someone does have it. 
Um, toxoplasmosis, most people are already immune to it and have been in contact with it at some point in their lives. And oftentimes it doesn't always lead to infection um, via the placenta of the neonate. So it's much lower risk. And honestly, I feel like if we screened everyone for it, everyone would come back positive. So yeah, just important to know. Very high yield to know those tests. I'll pass over to Mark now for these ones. Okay, well done. Um, so the answer is D, which most people got, which is fantastic. Um, just for uh, revision's sake, um, so the management is, uh, so this patient has premenstrual syndrome um, and the management is to start on a COCP or an SSRI. Um, there are a few other distractors in here as well. So nobody thought it was major depressive syndrome. Um, just because the patient didn't have two of the known symptoms, um, like irritability, mood swings, lasting more than two weeks. So it didn't really meet that definition. Um, in addition to that, um, we didn't think it was dysphoric uh, disorder, though. Um, and that reason that was because in this patient, if they had that, they'd have a stem which had more severe physical and psychological distress than this. Um, and for B, um, the, the, it was the correct diagnosis in B and C. Um, however, it's the incorrect management. Um, as I said, the management is CO, uh, combined oral contraceptive pills and SSRI medication, one of those first. Um, but well done. Uh, next question. Great, well done. Um, I think most people said the correct answer, which is C. So this patient has ovarian torsion and it is a surgical emergency. Uh, some of the other things do make sense, like you know, antibiotics, CT scan, except the thing is that um, this is something where it has to be treated urgently. Um, so getting the patient to theater is the most important thing. Um, D is incorrect um, as this is, um, yeah, so the most important thing is to go into laparoscopic surgery and the, um, there's an oophorectomy. Um, I, it says that it's elective and that's why D is incorrect. And E is also incorrect because even though analgesia is important, um, it's not 
the most important thing needs to be done straight away. I need to go to theatre. So um, as Georgia wisely said um, earlier on, um, a lot of the ONG questions, multiple of the answers are correct. It's just a matter of like, which is the thing you have to do first to rule out or to fix the red flag condition. Um, if you don't mind me adding, Mark, as well, in this instance, um, yes, you know, you would maybe consider an oophorectomy not as an elective but as, like, an emergent thing, but you want to try and save the ovary if possible. So that's also why that's not correct is you want to do everything you can to save the ovary first. And if you follow up in 48 hours, that ovary is going to die before you manage that properly. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, and this is one where I, we're looking for the false answer here. Oh, amazing. Um, and the answer is C, that's correct. Um, so it's correct in that it's the incorrect or false statement. Um, so normally the placenta should be um, around two centimeters above the margin of the internal os in the cervix. Anything closer to that um, is placental previa. So it's really important that um, we screen for that in the antenatal um, ultrasounds um, and that's an important fact to know. I guess the most common distractor was D um, and this is um, correct because beta um, HCG is secreted from the placental tissue um, which prevents the degradation of the corpus luteum and at around 8 to 12 weeks the placenta takes over from the corpus luteum and becomes the dominant source of progesterone. So that's why D is incorrect. Sorry, everyone, there's a bit of reading on this. <laughs> Okay, uh, the correct answer is D, and that's what most people said. So well done. Um, we'll just go through the common distractors. So the reason it was D is because primary ovarian insufficiency is the loss of ovarian function before the age of 40. Um, this is the most likely diagnosis for Stephanie um, because she has met some of the criteria. Um, I don't know if you have to remember the exact criteria, but um, it's FSH levels greater than 25 on two occasions in the last month, um, following four to six months of oligo am amenorrhea with the exclusion of other causes. So, um, yeah, um, so yeah, that's why it's primary ovarian 
insufficiency. Um, also, a few people have mentioned um, there was a typo for menarche um, versus menstruation on the previous question. So I'm sorry about that if there was a typo. Um, we'll definitely fix that in our question bank for next year. Um, but coming back to this question, um, so the, yeah, the answer is D. Um, I think that there was another, just some people thought it was hypothyroidism. Um, and I think that it's unlikely to be that because her TSH level is normal. Um, so we might jump to the next question. Okay, great. Um, so the answer is B. Um, well done. Um, most people got that. I'll just run through some of the common distractors. So the reason it was B was that uh, surgical management with DNC um, is appropriate because the patient's hemoglobin is 95 um, and the patient lives three hours away from a hospital. So surgical management would ensure timely and definitive management. Um, some of the other options that some people said were A, um, so A is incorrect because medical management with misoprostol is unsuitable because the patient has asthma. They also have a hemoglobin less than 100, and they also live further than an hour away from a hospital. Um, and I think the other option was expectant management. Um, and the reason that this was incorrect was the patient's distance from the hospital. Um, so close monitoring wasn't available. Um, and yeah, so that was why D and E were not really good options because it was so they were so far away from the patient. I'll hand over to Georgia. So next question. So we had a fairly even split on this one. Um, this is something that's very high yield and I think you should all know very, very well for your exams. So it seems like most people identified that this was vaginal thrush, um, so candida. So that was very good. Anytime you see curd-like vaginal discharge or yeast-like odour, that screams vaginal thrush. That's very um, suggestive of that. I can see a few people picked A, which is metronidas. Also, I'm wondering if maybe they thought this was um, BV. BV is sort of less of that curd-like vaginal discharge and less of that itch and more of that like malodorous discharge. Um, 
so they'll say like the large amounts of malodorous discharge. But in this case, the itch plus the curd like screams rush. Um, in terms of the treatment, that's sort of the next pitfall that a few people got confused with. So with thrush and sort of bacteria, uh, sorry, yeast infections in general, we don't tend to actually treat people with oral antifungals such as clotrimazole. We tend to only give them topicals. And that's because oral um, antifungals don't really get to the source as well as topical agents. And also um, we don't usually give them unless it's sort of a widespread Antifung like in fungal infection in an immunocompromised individual, we sort of more only give topical treatments for fungal infections. So for the people who picked B, you're right, it is clotrimazole, but it would be PV, um, clotrimazole rather than oral. Um, and then for the people who picked D, you're correct. So broad spectrum antibiotics and antibiotics in general are a risk factor for um, thrush because they kill off all of the normal um good bacteria that exist in the vagina and stop the overgrowth of candida. Um, so if there's any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or flag us down. Oral fluconazole. Again, it's probably less likely that we'd actually give oral fluconazole. We just don't tend to give oral agents for thrush. Um, there's usually a cream that people can even purchase over the counter at the pharmacy without a prescription. Um, and it's usually like a three to seven day treatment um, where people just insert cream into the vagina, um, plus or minus around sort of the vulva. And that usually is enough to clear it up in most people. And if you are getting recurrent um, infections of thrush to the point where you were given oral antifungals, I think there'd be greater concern that something more serious is going on. Um, and I'm not sure it would be as effective in treating it either. Cool. Amazing. So next question. So the correct answer in this instance was myomectomy, um, which just about everyone got. So that was really good. But probably the other common distractor that people identified was TXA and metaphenic acid. Um, I guess in these this instance, like that could be an appropriate treatment for heavy menstrual bleeding. However, in the question, we actually see that Grace wants to have a pregnancy in the next two to three years. Um, so with people who have leomyoma, um, they, it actually can impede their fertility and mean that it's more difficult for them to fall pregnant. And the one treatment that's here that would potentially have an effect on her pregnancy and like and her ability to fall pregnant and improve her chances of falling pregnant is actually a myomectomy. Um, so I believe it's something to do with it reduces the bulk in the uterus and gives more area for the pregnancy to implant. Um, but with the other ones, an endometrial ablation, that would be pretty poor for her. She probably wouldn't be able to fall pregnant after having her endometrium removed. Um, and hysteroscopy DNC probably, again, not very conducive to falling pregnant and poses the risk of Asherman's adhesions and things like that. And then D, we obviously don't want to leave it untreated because this is causing her issues. Um, when going through your OBS and GYN questions, it's actually very important to think about the age of the patient and also whether or not it says in the STEM if they've completed their family or whether they want to fall pregnant imminently because that will influence your management in a number of conditions. So just pay attention to that. Um, 
I can see Esther has just said, what size would you do a myomectomy and what size would you do no treatment? I don't know if there's a particular cutoff off the top of my head, unless like feel free to chime in, Mark. Um, I think it's more to do with symptoms and what the patient wants. So in this instance, because she's wanting to fall pregnant, if you continue to do nothing, she's probably going to have a hard time falling pregnant and she's pretty distressed by the treatment by, um, sorry, the symptoms. So that's why you'd want to treat in this instance. If she was sort of unbothered by the treatment, uh, by the symptoms, or potentially she didn't want to fall pregnant, then you could consider no treatment and say it was like an incidental finding. You could not treat it then. Or if she just was sort of troubled by the symptoms, but otherwise wasn't particularly eager to have surgical management, that's when you'd consider something like TXA. Does that make sense? If there's specific numbers you're after, you may need to go to prompt for that. Um, but sorry, I can't answer that. <laughs> cool. All right, we'll move on to the next question. Mark's just put five centimetres in the chat is when they start to worry. All right. Well done, everyone. Pretty much everyone got this one right, which is really good. Um, so we would, in this instance, perform a total zonal hysterectomy for Emily. So in this instance, we've got a woman, it says in the sentence again, in the first sentence again, she has a completed family. So we are no longer going about things with the aim of preserving fertility. We have decided, all right, we're not worried about fertility preservation. Let's just do what we can to control the symptoms and make life easy for the patient. So we can see that she's got adenomyosis and she's also got multiple fibroids. So in this instance, we would be considering taking the entire uterus out just to get rid of all of the pathology, basically. There's a lot going on. So in this instance, given that she's already completed her family, it makes sense that we just remove everything rather than mucking around, trying different treatments, seeing if they work, trying a marina, trying an endometrial elevation, and then if that's not successful, having to go back in or try something different, if that makes sense. I saw someone put in the chat, why would we do a total abdominal and not a total laparoscopic? Um, I'm not sure. That's probably it, more. It's because the patient has, sorry to jump in, George. I think it's because the yeah, patient has lots of fibroids um, and it, it's a very enlarged uterus that probably couldn't be removed that, um, removed other ways. Yeah, good point. Thanks, Mark. Um, any other questions about that from anyone? And I guess in this instance, we only had one hysterectomy option anyway. So that makes it easier for us.
again, tricky one. I can see where a few people may have fallen down. This was, again, a tricky question in that it was very specific on the wording of what they're asking for. So I can see quite a few people put BSL over 11 after two hours. In this instance, I understand like that screams diabetes, but in this case, we're asked for GDM, so gestational diabetes mellitus. 11.4 BSL after two hours is more suggestive of overt diabetes. So again, this is a tricky one where they're being specific, but remember, if someone has anything, either fasting above seven or um, sort of random glucose above 11, that's your criteria for overt diabetes mellitus, not for GDM. GDM is slightly lower. So in this instance, option A is probably okay because, again, with but after one hour, we expect things to be below 10. Um, and then after two hours, we expect things to be between, sorry, below 11, basically. Yeah, Mark's put the thing in the chat. That's probably easier. So we see fasting BSL of over 5.1 is indicative of diabetes, of GDM, and then a OGT BSL 8.5 to 11 after two hours is indicative, um, and a BSL of 10 after one hour is also indicative. Just know the values for your exams. Again, it's one of those things afterwards you can always look up. Um, but I know last year they expected us to know these values. So, yeah, just be aware of that. Um, and just remember the difference between GDM and overt diabetes in pregnancy as well. All right, well done. Most people got this one correct. So the answer is A. Um, so preeclampsia is something that's very, very, very high yield for your exams. So know it inside out, please. It's very important um, and it is an emergency. So it's fair game as far as the examiners are concerned. Um, so again, diagnose, we're looking for what is not true in this instance. So please remember to read the question carefully as Mark and I have been banging on about this entire um, session. So diagnosis can be made if systolic blood pressure is above 140, even if there are no other features or symptoms. So this is incorrect. If you go back to, oops, part C, autoimmune conditions is what that means. So AI in sorry, in option C is autoimmune. So sorry, going back to the first one, diagnosis can be made. In order to make the diagnosis of preeclampsia, we need the blood pressure component above 140, but we also need one feature of end organ damage. So thinking about your liver, your kidneys, your brain, so any neurological symptoms, fetal growth restriction, all of those things. So in this instance, that's the option that's not true. So the other distraction was acute management when blood pressure is above 170 over 90 is to lower blood pressure by nifedipine, nifedipine norbitolol or hydralazine. So that is correct. When someone's blood pressure is above 170, we want to lower that as soon as possible because remember that's a sign of fetal distress and maternal distress and that can exacerbate end organ damage. Um, and the last thing we want in eclampsia, in preeclampsia, is it flipping into eclampsia. 
So yeah, just please, 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 no eclampsia and preeclampsia inside out. It's very high yield. I'll pass over to Mark now. Okay, thanks, Georgia. Um, so I just want to clarify for question for answer C, the patient started on oral labetalol, not IV. So that's C. Well done, everyone. Um, C is the correct answer. Um, and we'll go through the reasons. Um, so as we said in the previous question, um, this patient, a similar sort of story, the patient has developed preeclampsia and now she has hepatic neurological and renal involvement. Um, and sorry, I'm reading the wrong question here. Um, so yeah, so basically this is a patient who has visual disturbances, um, she has frothy urine, but her blood pressure is not quite high enough to to go home yet. I uh, sorry to warrant IV hypertensions, uh, antihypertensives like hydralazine or labetalol. So in this case, um, you start the patient on labetalol orally, um, and then be, she continues on that for the remainder of the pregnancy. She also needs increased fetal and maternal monitoring, um, and likely she would probably be in short stay or um, even admitted for a few days, but I don't think they would start IV hydralazine straight away. Um, in terms of the other um, the other options here, I think B was the option. Um, so I think that you wouldn't start um, IV therapy at 140. Um, the previous question said that you would start it at around 170 or so. Um, so it's a little bit, but I would refer you to prompt guidelines and I can fact check that in our questions exactly when you start IV. Um, you wouldn't do an, an emergency cesarean as the, the fetus is only um, at 24 weeks gestation. Um, and I don't think it's appropriate just to reassure the patient and send them home because they have signs of uh, preeclampsia. So hopefully that answers um answers that one for you guys and i'll put into the chat exactly when you start um iv um antihypertensive so let's jump to the next question Cool, amazing job. Um, we have a hundred, um, most people said uh, B, which is correct. Um, so just um, just for revision, you if you have a rhesus negative mother who has a rhesus positive fetus, that can cause a sensitizing event and she becomes exposed to the rhesus antigen. Um, and then in the next pregnancy, um, 
that child is at risk of developing hemolytic disease of the newborn. So well done, everyone who got B right. I think uh, this is very high yield for the exam, knowing about rhesus uh, factors. Um, cool. All right, let's jump to 28. Great job, everyone. Um, so this one was shoulder dystocia. Uh, so this is a classic buzzwordy question um, where you have the turtleneck sign where you see the head deliver and then retract. And it's sort of a, a sign of like the of shoulder dystocia. So well done. Um, very high yield for the exam. And just George has helped me correct that as well. Um, as I was saying that um, for the previous question, if the blood pressure is not super high so it's like 140s or so you can use libidolol po um more long term or acutely however if the blood pressure is very very high um 160s 170s 180s that's when you look at iv um, i don't think you'd probably have to certainly i didn't know last year the exact cutoff of when you would do either so i think that's probably enough to know for the exam mm -hmm. um, did you want to add anything georgia um, I think I was just going to say, like, if you think about how you're delivering the drug and how urgently you want to lower the blood pressure, it makes sense to give it IV if you want to lower the blood pressure quite urgently. Um, whereas obviously if someone's just got a high blood pressure and you're they're halfway through their pregnancy, they've got maybe like some urinary changes, but that's it. You're probably not going to send them home on IV libidolol. You're going to try and manage them with orals as much as possible, if that makes sense. Cool. Makes sense. Right. Thank you, Georgia. Uh, all right, cool. 29. Okay, well done. Um, so this is, um, the answer to this is D. Um, and this is an early deceleration due to a head compression. Um, one tip I gave my two group um, for obstetrics and gynae this year was that an easy way if you're bad at reading CTGs is if you're not sure if it's early or what not, if they sort of line up um, like these two, then it's a pretty good bet that it's early. Um, so in this case, you can see the accelerations and the decelerations, the peak of both sort of line up, which is indicative of a um, an early deceleration. Um, now, I was also going to say as well, um, there's a really good mnemonic that um, is useful if you haven't heard of it called veal chop. Um, 
So I'll put it in the chat. But basically, you write so you write veal, V E A L, and then you write chop on the other side. And so for V, you align variable decelerations up with chord compression. Um, early decelerations are caused by head compressions. Accelerations line up with O, which is OK. And late decelerations line up with P for placental. Uh, insufficiency. So often, if you don't know exactly what it is, but you have the other cause of it, it can help you rule out um, specifically what it is or isn't. So in this case, um, if you were to know that um, early decelerations are caused by head compression, that would be enough to answer this question. So I'll put that in the chat. But if you want to like learn a high yield way to just like mnemonic your way through a CTG. Veal chalk is a pretty good way to do it. Um, okay, uh, next question, please. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Great job, um, amazing. So this is a DCDA twin pregnancy. And because the first twin or the presenting twin, I should say is um, in breach, an elective cesarean is indicated at 37 to 38 weeks. And the reason this is done is because there is an increased risk of complications um, of the breach twin, um, including fetal hypoxia, head entrapment and birth trauma. Um, it's in a lot of, uh, in some twin pregnancies, you can use external uh, cephalic version. Um, however, because this uh, twin A is in breach, it's not appropriate. You wouldn't want to immediately hospitalize this patient because there's no sign of fetal distress or preterm or imminent um, active labor. So therefore it doesn't make sense for hospitalization to occur. Um, but yeah, that's all of our questions. Um, I think we've tried to answer as many of the questions you've sent us in the chats as possible. Thank you very much for having us and uh, good luck with your exam. Yeah, thank you so much, guys. Good luck. You'll get through it. All right. I might just click start. Uh, awesome. So that's your first question. Yeah, that's fine. It'll, it'll go just the title slide. So just click.
All right. So a bit of a spread in the uh, answers. I think the first thing to note is always be like wary of what the question's actually asking. So re realizing that it's least likely and not most likely. I think that can trip a lot of people up. In terms of why it's D, so if you're thinking that they've got an infection or sepsis, you think about things like increased respiratory rate, um, high temperature, and if it's really bad and septic shock, then hypotension. So if you like with an MCQ, it's about like playing the game, right? So you want to rule out, like cross things out that obviously aren't the case. So um, like I said, hypothermia is likely, hypotension can be likely if they're shocked, um, hypothermia um don't it's not really associated with early onset sepsis but decreased rest rate is um the answer here um i don't really know what else to say about this question so we'll move on um Awesome. So a lot of people got this one right, which is nice to see. Um, the question, so you've got a newborn who's developed jaundice um, less than 24 hours. So there are a few differentials for that. Um, main one in this stem being hemoly um, hemolysis. Um, and then so if we go through the options, um, like you're basically trying to see what will you know, be raised in someone with um, hemolysis. So you'd have, expect to find a high reticulocyte count because you've got a lot of immature red blood cells being produced in response to um, the hemolysis. Um, Coombs test would be positive because you're thinking it's an ABO incompatibility. Hepatosplenomegaly can happen, except this is really non-specific, so it can happen on a lot of different things. Um, so not necessarily the most strong kind of sign to support this. Um, and then you would see an elevated bilirubin, but it would be unconjugated. Conjugated bilirubin would be raised in um, something, someone with an obstructive picture. So that's why one and two would be most correct. Oh, nice. Um, awesome. Uh, don't think I need to go through this in too much depth apart from um, it's important to know the difference between RDS and um, TTN for the purpose of exams um, and just knowing what buzzwords are on the x-ray. Um, but yeah, I don't think I need to go into too much depth with this one because you guys are smashing it.
Nice. Awesome. Good to see that a lot of people um, got this one. Um, just the main thing here is that um, in babies or um, children with absent chromasteric reflex, you're kind of worried about testicular torsion and that's a surgical emergency. Um, so obviously you'd want an urgent surgical review. Um, another kind of common thing that people can kind of uh, get trapped on is like using CTs. And just remember that in children, oh, hello. Um, just remember in children that um, we try to avoid any um, radio, like um, radiation exposure just because they are so little. Um, ultrasound uh, can be used, except like I said, you want, like the, the ultrasound isn't going to fix it. Um, they need to get into theatre um, to, to kind of explore what's going on and potentially fix the issue. Nice. Um, so what we're worried about in this patient here is that um, the, the baby might have um, whooping cough. Um, and so there's kind of two parts to the question, knowing what organism causes which kind of condition. Um, I think also the main thing is just because the patient has had a DTP vaccine doesn't necessarily mean his chances of um, getting whooping cough is completely zero. Um, he's just less likely to get the really serious complications. Um, more clinical signs and symptoms typical of whooping cough is kind of like the 100-day cough. So um, the cough can be like can last a really, really long time um, and it's usually associated with that facial cessation and vomiting and like these massive coughing fits. So that's what's being described in the stem here. Um, but you guys are smashing it. Nice. Okay. So um, I always used to hate these kind of questions when I was doing them. Um, but just looking at the stem, uh, we're kind of concerned that she's got orbital cellulitis. Um, and if you remember, orbital cellulitis is a medical emergency because if you leave it too long, then you can get irreversible blindness. A blindness. Um, so the best initial step would be referring to ophthalmology. Um, in terms of the antibiotics, they're not necessarily going to be like they're not going to have any effect in the next like two minutes um whereas like if you get that referral in really quickly opthal can go see them um and the management may be they have to be going to theater so that's the reason why d would be the most correct option um but in terms of if you were going to give antibiotics a would be right that would probably be after you refer to opthal so the question was initial step um so just be careful with questions like that is the main point
Nice. Um, so remembering epiglottitis is the three Ds, so drooling, dis- um, distress, and dysphagia. It's caused by a Hib infection. And so it's really uncommon in Australia because Hib is part of the national vaccine program. Um, so you get concerned about people who have been traveling or immigrated from overseas because their immunization program may not um, have include hip. Um, the main distractor would probably be bacterial tracheitis. I used to always get confused as well in fourth year, but I remembered bacterial tracheitis is basically croup, but worse. So toxic croup. Um, so yeah, that's the main thing for that. All right. So this one is quite difficult. This is like a children's health slash GPSN crossover. Um, So this is kind of a question about kind of long-term chronic management of asthma. And so um, this patient's already on a Saba, which is the Ventolin. They're already on an inhaled corticosteroid. Um, And the first thing you want to assess is if they're compliant with it um, or if they're actually doing it. And this patient is. Um, They're uh, I don't have any pictures on the slides, but there are two different asthma ladders um, depending on the age of the patient. So there's one for children less than five and then one for children above five. Um, the main difference is that, so, okay, so she's on the Ventolin, that's the first rung. She's on the steroid, which is the second rung. So really we're asking what's the next step. So the third rung that you add on. Um, there's a mix of answers between mainly A and C, and those are probably the two kind of I would be guessing between as well. The reason why it's A is because this patient's three, and so the next step would be adding on um, Montelukast or increasing the dose of the steroid. Um, C would be correct if they were above five. So that's the main difference between the two kind of asthma ladders. Um, this is a uh, steroid LABA combination. Um, and we don't typically give these medications in children under five. Um, inhaled ipotropium is a uh, SAMA. They're not really indicated in asthma. You'd only find that in COPD. Um, so that's why it's not, um, that's not ipotropium. But this one was a hard one. So it's kind of mean. I don't think they'd actually give you that in the exam. <laughs> Nice. Um, so 
even if you don't know what Alport syndrome is, um, you can kind of go through it based on a process of elimination. Um, but Alport syndrome is a classic, pre- uh, this is a classic presentation of Alport syndrome, which has a triad of kidney disease, hearing loss and eye abnormalities. Um, it's X-linked inheritance. And just a top tip is if there's anything that has like inheritant, inheritance modes, it's probably a good idea to know them um, because that is very examinable. Um, if you didn't know what Alport syndrome was, you could probably kind of do a deduction like a deduction of which ones aren't right so if they've got hematuria it's not going to be minimal change in nephrotic syndrome because it doesn't doesn't really present with hematuria and if they've got IgA nephropathy they would have um, alluded to like a preceding infection beforehand and that's how you could also get to Alport syndrome so um, PEDS is very buzzwordy and it's also about playing the game so (laughs) Oh, wow. Awesome. Um, so um, the answer is A. Um, so the question's asking which one's most accurate. Um, VUR is typically caused by an anatomic anomaly, um, which is this picture here. Um, so usually it's something to do with how the ureters are going into the bladder. And um, usually it's because there's a short segment in the muscle. And as the muscle of the bladder wall contracts, it kind of um, can occludes this and all the urine kind of goes back up. Um, And so as children get older, what actually happens is that ureter kind of gets longer um, and the issue actually kind of resolves on its own. Um, Sorry, let me just, oh, oh no, what did I do? Um, In terms of the other questions, so D is incorrect because it's actually higher in females rather than males. Um, And then B, uh, I'd always be cautious about when questions like answers say all or very definitive. So surgical intervention is the first line for all cases. It's obviously not all cases. It depends on um, how um, patients are presenting. And then long-term antibiotic prophylaxis is only recommended for people with high grade VUR. So not all patients again. Um, then moving on to the next question. Awesome. Um, so this patient ha- is presenting with DKA. Um, and if we remember DKA management, you can remember it for the mnemonic spider. So S for saline. Um, insulin infusion is important, um, but giving them fluids is probably the most important first step because patients in DKA are obviously, um, are very kind of dehydrated. So they've got really low extravascular volume, um, by giving them fluids as well, you're kind of diluting the glucose that's in their blood as well. And you're also promoting, um, the renal function. So help clearance of glucose. Um, insulin is the next step after that. Um, so if you remember spider, that's the order that you would be considering, um, the management for, for DKA.
Awesome. Um, so this patient, we're worried that she's got rheumatic fever. So she's got kind of things that fit the Jones criteria. So she's got joint pain, fever. She's got that erythema marginatum rash. Um, she's also got a preceding infection, which could be strep throat. And so um, the most appropriate management for rheumatic fever is Ben Pen. Um, if Ben Pen wasn't an option there, you can also give them phenoxymethyl penicillin. Um, so the others aren't necessarily the um, appropriate treatment for rheumatic fever. Awesome. Everyone kind of got this right. So buzzword for coarctation is differences in the blood pressure in the upper extremities and lower extremities. The other heart conditions here don't do that. They either have murmurs or they present um, as a cyanotic disease. Yeah, like, no, just plug it in. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, USB. <laughs> I like left my house. <laughs> no, that's not a good thing. Nice. Um, so again, two parts to this question, figuring out what exactly this baby has and then figuring out what you see on the sign. Um, so what's being described here is um, Tetralogy of Fallow um, and the fact that they are pulling their knees up to their chest, that's um, being, uh, that's a tet spell. Um, and so the reason why they kind of get better when they pull their knees to their chest because they're increasing their um vascular resistance and that kind of increases um, blood flow back to the heart and that's why they feel a bit better. Um, buzzword for tet fellow and x-ray is a boot-shaped heart. Egg on string is um, seen in TGA um, and snowman sign. It's not, I don't think it's a, a condition on the children's health um, matrix, but it's seen in total anomalous pulmonary venous return. So T-A-P-B-R. Um, but yeah, that's why A is correct.
Nice. Um, you guys are like experts. Um, so the stem is describing someone with Turner syndrome. So kind of the main characteristic findings of someone with Turner syndrome would be someone with a short stature, web neck, um, broad chest, low set ears. And that's kind of like what's being described here. Um, and then next thing of the question is like knowing what the carrier type is. So, um, to people with Turner syndrome is 45 X, um, number A is actually describing Klinefelter's syndrome. So this is usually seen in um, boys with an extra X chromosome and that presents differently. Um, 40 B and D are obviously normal carrier types. Nice. Um, I hated these sorts of questions. I hated this condition in particular in fourth year. Um, but so the question is asking kind of which enzyme is going to be um, elevated or decreased, what you're going to see in someone with classic CAH. Um, and so I think a good way to, oh, no, um, a good way to remember is trying to get your head around. You don't need to memorize this off by heart, obviously. Um, but patients with classic CAH um, have a deficiency in this enzyme here. Um, and so you kind of get this backlog of 17 OHP um, and that kind of causes you to um, produce a lot of more, um, more sex hormones. And so the reason why the answer is this is B is because if you don't have this enzyme converting um, that into whatever it needs to be, it's going to be backlogged. So if you kind of work through the other options, none of them really make sense with a 21 hydroxylase um, deficiency. Nice. Um, so the main two contenders here for answers was obviously A and D. D is the correct answer. Um, so SMA is a kind of degenerative disease of the um, motor neurons in the anterior horn. So it typically presents with lower motor neuron signs. So the poor muscle bulk and then the absent reflexes. DMD, um, if you just like remember the picture of like the child with like the massive calf muscles, um, obviously that's not poor muscle bulk, um, but DMD doesn't present like this. They're not usually floppy. Usually they have a kind of um, characteristic walk. Um, some people said cerebral palsy. That's a good, um, good kind of um, one to consider, but cerebral palsy kind of presents with more upper motor neuron signs. So CP usually occurs because of hypoxia during birth. And so um, uh, you kind of get the hyperreflexia, hypertonia, and that's not, that's not what's being described here. 
polymyositis, no one said that, but usually it's kind of um, caused by like a preceding viral infection. It, it's pretty clear that they've um, got an infection beforehand. Awesome. So the question, the answer was A. Um, the main thing with the seizures in terms of the matrix is knowing not only what epilepsy and seizures are and how to manage them, but unfortunately there's also a lot of different syndromes <laughs> that come under that topic and knowing kind of things that differentiate um, those from each other. Um, so the kind of main things here for Rolandic epilepsy, um, it's uh, has a good prognosis. It's pretty benign um, and it usually occurs at nighttime or when they like wake up early in the morning. So here you can see that the child is twitchy overnight. And so that's kind of like what's cooling you to Rolandic epilepsy. Um, Rolandic epilepsy is also associated with a lot of facial symptoms. So kind of like facial group, tongue movements, kind of drooling from the mouth as well. So if you see that in the stem, you'd probably be thinking Rolandic epilepsy. Um, we have actually, oh, no, oh, sorry. I've got a table here that kind of summarizes them all quite nicely, just because there are so many. Um, with Dravet syndrome, which was the next option, um, it's typically triggered by like hot temperatures or if they're febrile, um, there's kind of an inheritance pattern to it. Um, and there's also associated growth delay. Um, pseudo seizures, um, it's kind of like a diagnosis of exclusion. So it's not one that you just like pick out out of the blue. Um, and then West syndrome, it's kind of the typical like infantile spasm. So like the jackknifing. So like suddenly drawing up their legs, their arms are flinging out. I think that's the most common one to come up on exams, but there's also some other ones here. So if you kind of like look at this table and kind of take what you want, um, particularly like the buzzwords. Um, so just knowing the symptoms and how they present and potentially even how they present on EEG um, because that that can also be tested as well but unfortunately that's just one that um, it's a bit of a cop sometimes Nice. Um, so I think the main thing here is knowing the difference between Perthes disease and Sufi. Um, so we've got a, quite a few risk factors for Sufi in the stem. So we've got um, a boy with a high BMI and we've also got an externally rotated leg. Um, that's typically how Sufi presents. So if you remember, Sufi is kind of like a fracture, right? The um, caption of the, the leg. Um, and so they typically present with like a bit of a limp, a limp. They're a bit, they're in a bit of, in a bit of pain. And in terms of management, they need surgical, they need basically surgery. Um, Perthes disease typically um, occurs in males between four to eight. Um, and it's just idiopathic avascular necrosis um, of the femoral head. But in terms of management, you kind of just leave them alone and they get better on their own. Um, so just knowing the difference between those two and risk factors for two those two um, is uh, the most important thing for this one. 
Um, transient synovitis usually has a preceding infection beforehand. Idiopathic arthritis is typical, like inflammatory sort of picture. Um, so like red, hot, swollen, that sort of thing. Nice. Um, so it's just knowing the blood tests, uh, the blood results of someone with iron deficiency anemia. Um, we can kind of rule out A and B because you'd expect them to be low. Um, and also when you're looking at blood tests for someone with iron deficiency anemia, you'll find that probably most doctors don't necessarily care about the ferritin. They mostly look at transferritin and um, transferrin saturation. Um, and if that's low, that's indicative of iron deficiency and anemia, especially since iron is an acute phase reactant. So sometimes that can be raised. And so usually if you're suspecting IDA, they'll also order like a CRP just to see if, you know, if they are having kind of that inflammatory process, could that explain why the ferritin's raised? Um, between C and D, um, D is most likely to be associated with um, patients with IDA because there's, you know, the transport protein for the iron is low because there's no iron to bind to anyway. TIBC is total iron binding capacity. And that essentially just measures how, like how much of the transferrin is able to bind to iron. And so that would be high because you have low iron. And so you've got a lot of free transferrin. So you've got a lot of opportunity for transferrin to bind to iron. Um, so you'd expect that to be high rather than low. Nice exclamation point, doing well. Sorry, a, D is ALL as in like acute lymphoblastic leukemia, not like all of the above. <laughs> Sorry, just to clear that up. Like <laughs> pretty rough for a patient if they got A, B and C. <laughs> Oh, nice. Even with that, you guys guessed it. Um, so uh, we've got here in the stem someone who's fatigued, they're bleeding a lot, um, and they've kind of got uh, bruising and everything. Um, and so you're worried about ALL because they've kind of got the red blood cell symptoms, white blood cell symptoms, and like the uh, reduced platelets. Um a and B typically would present with fatigue, but necess not necessarily, you know, increased bruising or increased sickness. Um, and then hypothyroidism is also a differential for fatigue, but D would kind of explain the whole clinical picture in this case. Um, but yeah.
I have not read this again. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks. I don't know. How... Yeah, sorry, but so I was like reading. My chair. Nice. Um, I don't think there's too much to explain here apart from this patient exhi is exhibiting signs of increased intracranial pressure. Um, and so the vomiting, the um, headaches, um, being unwell, uh, if you're looking through the options here, um, the only one that would kind of suggest any sort of ICP would be papilledema. Um, and then uh, oh, the cause of the papilledema in this case, um, sorry, um, is cerebral astrocytoma. And so um, knowing kind of how different cancers can present in children um, and the buzzwords for it is also um, a good thing to note for exams. Nice. Um, so this is classic of intersusception. So um, buzzwords being like current jelly stool, the drawing up of the legs to alleviate the pain. Um, just some learning points about intersusception. It's commonly in the two month to two year age group. Um, and typically children are like quite irritable and distressed and they kind of uh, turn sort of pale. Um, some of the risk factors include being male and having a recent viral illness. Um, inflamed payers patches from a recent viral illness is, is likely, um, and it's likely probably the precipitant of intersusception. So um, intersusception would probably be the better um, option in this case. Alrighty, so a bit of a mix of answers here. Um, so in the STEM, we've got a child with bilious vomiting. Um, we've got some abdo distension, bowels not open. Um, what diagnostic test do you want to order? Abdo x-ray. So if you remember with children, we really don't like doing any kind of exposing them to any like um, x-ray or kind of CT. So when we order them, we have to make sure that, you know, we really need them. They're actually going to tell us what we need to know. Abdominal x-ray isn't necessarily going to tell you like it's you useful like you probably would get a positive sign but you know if you do get a positive sign will you need to follow that up with something like ct um so 
abdominal x-ray in this case is probably not the best thing. Um, the main thing you're worried about here is some sort of obstruction. So like a malrotation or like a, like, you know, just a normal bowel obstruction. Um, and so knowing exactly where it is and potentially like if they need to have any like surgical input is really important. So that's why abdominal x-ray wouldn't be the best case. Abdominal ultrasound like would, could be useful, but it's not the best um, diagnostic tests in this scenario. D being an upper GI contrast study is probably the best test just because um, it's quite like quick. Um, you can, you know, with the contrast, you'll be able to see where exactly the obstruction is as well. Um, you would only consider an abdominal ultrasound if maybe the contrast isn't going to be tolerated well by the child. Um, and then CT abdo pelvis is not necessarily the best thing that we want to order for a three week old because that's a lot of radiation. Um, so we want to avoid that at all costs. That one was a bit of a difficult one though. Long stem. Awesome. Um, so this one was a bit of a difficult one. Um, so we've got a patient who is dehydrated. Um, the notes, he actually say moderately dehydrated, but I would argue that this patient's quite severely dehydrated just because they're tachycardic. Um, they're oh, actually more. I'm going to change. I'm going to backtrack on that. Sorry. Um, I've just read the blood pressure. Um, so blood pressure is normal. Um, usually when the blood pressure is dropping, that's when you're really concerned about severe dehydration. Someone with like mild dehydration, they just kind of like look kind of unwell, but in terms of the markers and vitals are all fine. Um, so what this patient really needs is some fluids. So um, C and D is probably out of the picture. If you go to the RCH guidelines, what they recommend with people with moderate dehydration is um, a bolus at 10 mils per kilo to begin with, and then using maintenance fluids at the 4-2-1 rule. Um, people with severe dehydration, you start with a bolus that's a bit higher, so 20 mils per kilo, remembering that the bolus kind of dosing is between 10 to 20. So that's kind of the rationale behind that. Um, but I think, yeah, the main thing here is that the blood pressure is normal. It's kind of like a mix between mild and severe. So I actually probably would have also chosen B, um, but for whoever wrote this question said it was A. So <laughs> I don't know if that helps. Sorry, guys. <laughs> So um, a spread between A and B. Um, so the stem is describing this rash that kind of starts right at the face and then down to the body. Um, 
and then there's some sort of like sick contacts there. I think the two main differentials in this case would be rubella and measles just because the rash pattern typically starts kind of like behind the ears and then it spreads to the chest and then down further in the body. Chicken pox doesn't necessarily start at the face. It can really start anywhere. Um, and so you're kind of going between A and C. In terms of the management, with rubella and measles, you both just have supportive care and isolation. You wouldn't necessarily, you wouldn't need to give the MMR vaccine. That's not going to help you now. That's going to help you in the future, but that's not going to treat you. Um, so that's why the answer would be A. Um, chicken pox, you wouldn't really uh, prescribe antivirals unless um you know, they fail conservative management or they've got risk factors for really bad disease. Um, and then this isn't typical of scarlet fever, um, the rash distribution. So just know how different rashes present. That's probably more like in the GP section of the matrix, but also has a lot of crossover into the PEDS matrix. So knowing kind of like the viral infections in childhood um, and kind of like the different rashes that present. So like including stuff like meloscum and eczema and knowing kind of like the buzzwords for them and how they present um, is really important. Um, awesome. So this patient is presenting with a diagnosis of rheumatic fever and the definitive management would be phenoxymethylpenicillin. Um, it's important to note that the symptoms are very similar to Kawasaki, um, but in Kawasaki, we also see stuff like conjunctivitis and like peripheral erythema. Um, and, you know, in that case, you'd be giving IVIG and aspirin. Um, but yeah. Nice. Um, so again, with the congenital conditions, unfortunately, it's just something that you have to remember um, and how they present. We've already had Turner syndrome, so we already know how that presents. Um, this is Allegal syndrome, which is autosomal dominant and typically presents with the triangle face with the pointed nose. It's also associated with um, tetralogy of fallow, butterfly vertebrae, biliary atresia, and neonatal jaundice. Um, Williams syndrome, it's an autosomal micro deletion. And that's where you kind of have like the elf like faces, they're really talkative, they're really social, they've got strong personalities. Um, and then Angelman syndrome uh, is to do with maternal epigenetics. Um, and it's kind of like the hand puppet syndrome. So like they kind of like walk on their tiptoes, arms are up in the air. They're really happy and they've got kind of, they laugh at really inappropriate times. And that's how that typically presents. Um, so again, just, I don't know, like 
put them in your Anki, write them down on a table. Um, this is, yeah, this is unfortunately the bane of the your existence in, in children's health exams. Nice. Don't think I need to go into too much explanation with this one, but just knowing that there are different types of childhood cancers and knowing how they present. So in this case, you know, it's something to do with the renal system. So I've got blood in the urine. Um, you've got that mass and they've been falling asleep at school. So for tea, you've got some organ signs. I um, mean, just knowing which are out of those ones is to do with the kidneys. Fake homocytoma is um, a, a tumor of the adrenal glands. All right, so a mix between A and B. Um, so I think the biggest clue here is the proptosis of the left eye. So what's causing the eye to kind of bulge out? Rhabdosarcoma is a kind of soft tissue um, cancer. So a, like you'll have a growth of tissue in the soft tissue. And so you've got a bit of soft tissue at the back of your eye. So if you, you can imagine if you've got rhabdosarcoma, that eye is probably going to be bulging forward because of that excess pressure. Um, retinoblastoma doesn't affect the soft tissue. It actually affects the retina in the eye. So it's the problem within the eye itself and not surrounding it. So that's why it wouldn't present with proptosis. Instead, that kind of presents with leukocoria. So in the red light reflex, rather than it returning red, it will be white. Um, and that's the same with congenital cat um, cataracts. Periorbital cellulitis wouldn't cause proptosis. Periorbital cellulitis is a very superficial infection that's in front of the orbital septum. So it has nothing to do with the orbit itself. So it's not really going to change the position of the, eye um, the eyeball. Exclamation mark still in front. You guys thought you were done with ONG. Fortunately not.
All right. So mix between B and D, which is probably the two ones that do present like this. Um, so just a reminder that torch infections aren't necessarily only necess um, relevant in the O and G part of the matrix, but also the children's health. So knowing how they affect the mother and the baby is really important. Um, for uh, A, it's not HIV because HIV does cause hepatomegaly, but it's not really associated with neurological signs such as deafness. Um, it's not going to be C um, because it's not associated again with the hearing loss. Um, so really it's between rubella and CMV and they do both present quite similarly in that they have the hearing loss, they've got kind of like this rash, um, they've got hepatomegaly. Um, but with CMV, the main things um, to note is it does cause sensory neural hearing loss, but it's also associated with um, intraventricular calcifications and that can also cause other neurological problems on top of the hearing loss um, with rubella depending on when you get the rubella well, when the mother gets the rubella in her pregnancy you can have something called congenital rubella syndrome um, or you can just get um, hearing loss associated with rubella um, so in the next slide um, I've got kind of like summaries of each of the torch infections and how they present in the child um, so knowing kind of how they do is probably important um, and knowing like the buzzwords for them. So T, O, there's a lot of things for O, rubella. So here the main thing would be like the salt and pepper rash um, or even the blueberry muffin rash, usually associated with cardiac malformation. So things like heart murmurs and stuff. Um, and then this is like the timing depending on like when the mother gets it and stuff. CMV, so sensory neural hearing loss is really buzzwordy for CMV, um, developmental delay, that sort of thing. And then H for HSV or HIV. Um, but yeah, you can put that in your own notes uh, or take what you want. But almost there, guys. We've got like four questions. <laughs> uh, I might have given the answer away to this one, actually. <laughs> Nice. We really love that space repetition, guys. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so rubella, so um, hepatosplenomegaly, you got the jaundice, you got the machine like murmur because it's associated with PDA, the bluish purple rash, the bluish palpable rash is the blueberry muffin rash. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to go. Nice. Um, 
I heard some people saying what Osgood Schlatter's is. Osgood Schlatter's is basically like an inflammatory condition um, that affect that um, causes a lump below the kneecap. And usually it's associated with um, running, jumping, but can also be due to overuse. Um, but then, yeah, the typical presentation is there's pain like going upstairs. Um, that's the typical buzzword. Um, but this is very classic of arthritis. Nice. Um, so main thing here is just knowing what to do in someone who has status epilepticus. And then the first step would be giving them a benzo. And so the only thing here would be um, midaz midazolam. Um, refer to peas isn't going to help the patient right now. Exclamation mark, still ahead. Um, so this is following on from the previous question. So in status epilepticus, if you fire, if the patient doesn't respond to benzos twice, so after 10 minutes, then you kind of move on to using anti-epileptic drugs. And in this case, the only two anti-epileptic drugs are A and B. Um, lithium isn't one of them. Um, and according to ETG, um, you can either use phenytoin, uh, levoteracetam, which is Keppra, um, or sodium valproate. So that's why A would be the correct option in this case, except in children less than one month old, you wouldn't want to use phenytoin at all. Um, but yeah, if this patient hypothetically was going to keep seizing after you've given them the phenytoin, you'd give it to them again. Um, and then you, if they fail that, then they really need some ICU support or you need some real serious help in there. Um, you'd be thinking about things like propofol. This is the last question as well. So... <laughs> less than one year old don't use paint one month one month, one month.
Nice. So is fragile X syndrome, again, honing in the fact that you still do need to know your congenital sind- syndromes and how they kind of present. Um, Down syndrome, uh, every, like, you know, they've got the almond shaped eyes, the epicanthal folds and everything. Edward syndrome, they have low set ears and they have typically overlapping fingers. Fragile X has a long face, large ears. Prada willy syndrome, um, they typically are like uh, have hypopigmentation. Um, so like blonde hair, blue eyes, um, and some other facial features that I cannot remember. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and that's it for the children's health. Hopefully that was helpful. Um, but yeah, Muppets has a lot of MCQs as well. Just plugging Muppets there, but <laughs> a lot of OSCEs too. Thanks, Izzy. Um, yeah, I just want to shout out Izzy and Muppets as well, because I told them, I think earlier this morning that um, we might need a few more questions and they've done that in like less than a few hours. So another round of applause for them, please. Alrighty, guys, we might just uh, get started. I just get everyone to listen up quick. I'm Bailey from GPSN. I've got Bonin here with me also from GPSN. We're gonna run through some GP questions for you guys. I know you've had a long day, so we'll get started. Uh, hopefully they're useful for you guys uh, and then you can head off. Um, we've tried to sort of focus on GP topics that you probably haven't covered before, like in 3B and that kind of stuff. Uh, so hopefully it's helpful. Um, cool. All right, we'll start. Uh, it was too fast, was it? Is that what people are saying? Um, I don't know. Bad luck, I suppose. Um, <laughs> the most of you who answered got it right. Uh, so I think in this case, uh, the sort of history of tiredness, constipation, and also uh, increased body weight uh, is all sort of signs of hypothyroidism. Uh, the distractor in this one is the history of diabetes, but there's no real, uh, nothing in the stem that sort of makes you think it would be a sugar issue. Um, and there's no signs of anemia either. All right. All right. So we'll go to the next question. Alrighty, so bit of a split uh, between mainly A and C. So we'll talk through this one. Uh, so in this case, this is a history of like um, glaucoma, uh, but this is not the acute sort of like closed angle. This is more the chronic type. Uh, so I guess it's it's less urgent in that matter. Um, but if we just sort of go through the options, so so option A, which is the right answer here is a type of beta blocker that's used for glaucoma. Um, basically it works by reducing like the production of the aqueous humor, which is what's causing that increased pressure. Whereas in C, 
uh, that would be the case if you thought it was more the acute glaucoma because uh, that needs for more, more urgent intervention. But in this case, um, there's no sort of signs that it's that that level. Um, it's sort of more of like a gradual, like progressively worsening, but it's um, more gradual and the um, pressure of 29 isn't too bad. Um, whereas if it was like a, the acute type, you'd be looking at more like 40 plus kind of pressure. Uh, and then not many people went for the other options, but just for reference, option B would be for like, uh, if you had like giant cell arteritis causing your vision loss. And then option D is more for your proliferative um, changes with diabetes, the retinopathy there. Cool. All right, we'll move to the next one. Alrighty. Uh, so the vast majority got this one correct, which is good. Uh, just, just to sort of cover it off. So uh, this uh, condition is quite classically presents, you know, mostly asymptomatic um, with these sort of um, macules, which can cause either hyper or hypo pigmentation. And then they can sort of come together and cause sort of more patches like you can kind of see here. Um, so it's a bit of a spot diagnosis kind of um, derm. Uh, condition just to to know of but it seems like you guys are on top of that so we'll head to the next question Alrighty, uh, again, another pretty straightforward one that most of you got right. Uh, just the keys for this question. So um, the involvement of thumb and index finger is sort of indicating that median nerve um, involvement. The fact that she's 36 weeks pregnant is like a risk factor for carpal tunnel to be aware of. Um, and yeah, that's kind of the main things for this one. Just be the other options, just be aware of how they might present because they've they can come up. So, you know, for peripheral neuropathy, it's like the glove and stock stocking um, option B is more pain around the thumb rather than um, paresthesia. And then cervical radiculopathy is like sort of think of it like sciatica, but from the neck down the arm, basically. Okay, cool. We'll head to the next question.
um, most of you got this one correct as well. Um, so in this case, you've got a subconjunctival hemorrhage. Um, the keys to this question is the history of being unwell with a cough and then also like the physical activity, helping a friend move a house. They're all kind of like risk factors to de like cause a burst of a vessel. Um, so that's how you sort of can identify the diagnosis. And then from there, you know that it's just managed conservatively. So yeah, we'll move to the next question. Awesome. Guys doing very well. So again, this, uh, this condition's again, like a little bit buzzwordy, quite a bit of a spot diagnosis as well. So you get that Herald patch. Um, and then like a week later, you can get the sort of more spread smaller lesions, um, often like post uh, viral illness. Uh, it's also like quite classically occurring, like on the trunk and then the upper parts of the arms and thighs as well. So, um, it's a good one just to sort of be aware of it. It sort of presents very commonly like this. So yeah, we'll move to the next question. Alrighty, so a bit more of a split on this one. So we'll just take a bit more time to go through it. Um, so in this case, um, you have a 55 year old who hasn't had any PB bleeding for two years. So um, postmenopausal and then presenting with hot flushes and spotting. So it does sound a lot like menopause, otherwise being well and nothing else sort of of note. Um, I guess the key here, and I've, I sort of was a bit generous and bolded first, but the key to this station is, uh, sorry, this um, question is not necessarily what the correct management is or what's going to solve the issue, but what's the first thing you need to do. And anytime you, you've got like postmenopausal bleeding, you really need to rule out endometrial cancer. So that's why the answer is C uh, instead of like A or B, if you were thinking it's like menopause. In terms of the people who put D as the option, um, I guess the key to understanding that is, this wouldn't be screening. So this patient is symptomatic um, with PV bleeding. So you're not actually screening for anything. You're you're trying to diagnose. So a CST is like, it's in the name, it's a screening test. Um, so you, that's why you wouldn't do that. Um, so yeah, you'd want to be doing an ultrasound, ruling out cancer. And then from there, you could go on to do HRT uh, if, if it's sort of, you think it was menopause, but you've got to rule out cancer first.
Friday. Uh, again, a bit more of a split. So most of you got it right though, but we'll go through this one. So this um, question, like we spoke about earlier, this is much more like of a stem for an acute glaucoma. So you've got um, an, a sudden sort of 10 hours, so short history um, sort of associated with the pain, blurry vision, all that kind of stuff and vomiting as well. Um, this sort of image is very classic um, of how like the type of image they will use on, on the exam. Like it will look a lot like that. Um, the mid dilated pupil as well is like a big buzzword. And then you can see the pressure of 49 is much higher than the first question where it was like 29 or something. So I guess from there you've, you've identified it's acute glaucoma. So if we look at the options, we already talked about a being, uh, the management for the more like slow chronic type. So a topical beta block is not going to act immediately. It's going to take time to work. Um, so that's why that's not the answer. In terms of methyl prednisolone, so that being a steroid, again, that's more for your like giant cell arteritis type picture. Uh, and then obviously you, you need to manage this patient urgently, not review in 24 hours. So it leaves you with option C, which is a type of a diuretic and would, you know, act by reducing the fluid in the eye, basically. Um, other acceptable answers would obviously be like urgent referral to ophthalmology, that kind of thing. But in this case, um, you can rule out all the other options anyway. Cool. All right, we'll move on. All righty. So um, majority got it right, but a bit of a split again. So in this case, um, this kind of question is actually pretty high yield understanding um, like the different kind of medications used in pal care, but particularly the anti-emetics. They all have different mechanisms and as a result are more useful in different situations. Uh, so just go through that and make sure you understand. But for this question, we have a patient with uh, bowel cancer and they've got some... Um, They've got sort of nausea and vomiting, but they've also mentioned delayed gastric emptying. So when we think about an antiemetic, we want to use an antiemetic that also has like prokinetic effects. So to help um, stimulate the bowel. So um, in this case, that is C, like metoclopramide um, has that action through the dopamine receptors and so forth. Whereas on Dandertron, which is obviously another common antiemetic, that one is actually very constipating. So that's why you wouldn't want to use on dance, even though it might be very good at helping the nausea. It's it's going to worsen. Um, it's not going to help with like delayed gastric emptying. So it's not actually resolving the issue. Uh, so commonly on dance would be used more for like post chemo is sort of the classic. The option B has its action through the histamine receptors. And from my understanding, that doesn't really um, help with gastric emptying either. Um, and then dexamethasone uh, is often used um, for nausea and vomiting, which is as a result of uh, brain mets um, because of the, like it's, it reduces the intracranial pressure basically, which can contribute to vomiting. So in this case, um, metoclopramide is the one that's classically used when there's an issue with gastric emptying.
All righty. Um, so the majority got this question correct, which is good. So this sort of style of question is not that uncommon for GP exams. So where you've got questions about like electrolyte disturbances, I wouldn't say it's that important to understand all the fine details, but just knowing a few sort of key uh, topics, sort of key understandings for the different um, disturbances is important. Um, and often it can be medication related as it is in this stem. So you've got an um, elderly patient who has delirium secondary to gastro outbreak. Um, and then you've got a list of medications as well. And I guess this question is basically just a buzzword, understanding that uh, elderly patients who are on an SSRI, so sertraline in this case, um, are at more at risk for developing hyponatremia, particularly in the context of being unwell, such as with gastro. So that's kind of the key to this, this station, uh, sorry, this stem. So it's more just really buzzwordy rather than anything, but just one to be aware of if you haven't seen it before. Alrighty. Um, we'll talk through this one quite quickly. Again, this is a bit of a spot diagnosis. Um, I can understand that there's quite a split between A and B. Um, so in this case, this is uh, a sty um, or A. There's internal and external types. I'm not sure how mean they would be on an exam, but basically um, ex external is because it's sort of like on this side of the um eyelid where internal would be sort of on the other side. Um, so you wouldn't really be able to see it unless you pulled it down. Um, a chalazion, um, on the other hand, is not sort of at the, like at this line, it's more sort of underneath. Um, and it's not, it's sort of, um, I guess it's like, it's not as close to the skin. It's sort of more underneath. So um, where this one, you can kind of see like the sort of um, us developing on a, for a, a Calasian, you wouldn't really see, you just sort of see more of a lump. Um, so yeah, just be aware of what it looks like. Have, make sure you've seen a few photos, look it up in your own time. Um, in terms of blepharitis, that's more just like inflammation of the eyelashes. So it presents with sort of like a crusty kind of rash along the eye, eyelashes. And then a pterygium is like, um, it's like a fibrous kind of growth across the cornea. Um, so it doesn't involve the eyelashes at all or the, yeah. Um, a good way to sort of memorize this is that hordilium hurts and the sty stings. So they're both the same. Whereas the chalazion doesn't really have any like tenderness. So it's typically painless. Yeah, that's a good point as well. So the pain in the stem as well is another giveaway for A over B. Uh, so we might move on for time, but yeah, just good to be aware of these because they can come up. Uh, so just make sure you look them up before your exam.
Cool. Uh, so most of you got this one correct. So in this case, uh, this is a stem of biliary colic, uh, hence why the answer is ultrasound. Um, the key to understanding this stem is knowing some of the risk factors for developing gallstones. So in this case, um, female sex is a risk factor. The sort of age group uh, in the 30s is another one. Increased BMI. Uh, so you've got three kind of risk factors and um, a history which is suspicious for biliary colic. So uh, that's why you'd want to go ahead and do, do an ultrasound here. Cool. Um, most people got this one correct as well. Um, so there's a lot of clues in this question for Parkinson's. Uh, so like with the gates and then also the increased tone, um, I guess some of the distractors where there's like quite a long list of medications. Um, but like if you sort of work your way through, none of them are super um, commonly sort of causing falls. Um, peripheral neuropathy or a CVA, there's no real signs in the question either that those ones are present. So, oh yeah, fairly straightforward. Alrighty, so um, a bit of a split between A and B, but most people still got it right. So I guess um, I guess the key to understanding the difference, it can be a bit hard in terms of just looking at a photo. I'd say just for exams, they'd probably use a photo that looks quite bad for scleritis, whereas episcleritis might not look as bad. But I guess the key is also the severity um, of the symptoms. So in this case, they're saying it's severe pain, um, and also the fact that there's sort of that associated photophobia and pain on movement of the eye as well. Um, I guess those are all indicators that this is quite bad and therefore more likely A over B. Um, in terms of the other options, um, C is very unlikely to be bilateral and D is unlikely to be cause that kind of pain. It's more like the itchiness. Um, but in yeah, in terms of understanding why it's scleritis over episcleritis it's kind of the severity uh, and then also uh, it's it can be linked with inflammatory conditions so the past history of rheumatoid arthritis as well uh, is another sort of clue that it might be a over b
Cool. Uh, yeah, most of you got this one right. Um, not a not a tricky question, but something definitely to be aware of because I th say it's quite likely to come up. So understanding that statins are obviously first line for high cholesterol, um, but where to go next, um, azetamibe is the answer. Um, you don't really need to know any more details of like how it works or anything. Just, just this is a very classic stem of, you know, patient with high LDLs after being on maximum statin therapy. So just be aware of this one. Alrighty. Uh, most of you got it right. Very classical question again. Um, so yeah, perioral dermatitis classically doesn't get better with um, like steroid cream or things like that. Um, so just, yeah, be aware of this one. Uh, in terms of management, it's more commonly you, like you use a, uh, like doxy or another antibiotic for a few months. Um, but yeah, this is a very classic stem. So just good to be aware of. Alrighty, so a bit of a split here. Um, so we'll spend a bit more time on this one. So um, in this case, you've got a young kid who's injured their ankle um, and there's you've had an x-ray which shows no fracture. So you're not worried about that, uh, but they're still in a bit of pain. So what are you going to do? Um, so I think in this case, in this kind of question, the keys that they're trying to ask are one about like that WHO ladder of pain management. So obviously starting with, uh, your simple stuff before moving up to anything like an opioid. So clearly in this case, uh, B wouldn't be appropriate. So in terms of when you, when they say simple analgesia, you know, between uh, Panadol and an NZ, which one would be appropriate? I guess the, the understanding here is that uh, with paracetamol, there's very little um, side effects, you know, to be worried about with like a short-term use where I guess with NZs, there are a few more, um, there is a higher risk, I suppose, for side effects. And then also there is some thinking that um, because of the action of NZs to actually suppress that inflammatory response, that inflammatory response is actually important in healing. So if you can get adequate analgesia with paracetamol where you're not suppressing that inflammatory response, but you are controlling the pain, then I guess that is um, preferred um, over an NZ where it might give you equal equal uh, equal sort of pain relief, but you're also uh, impairing healing. So that's kind of the key uh, to why it's A and not C.
All righty. So um, most people got this one right, um, but a bit of a split. Um, I guess the key to this question, there's a couple of things, I suppose. The obvious one is the past history of the esophageal cancer. So despite that being, you know, a couple of years ago now, whenever there is a history of cancer, you are worried about recurrence and then secondary to that spread. Um, so in this case, you are worried about spread to the brain. So I guess the reasons why we think that's the case here and and why it would warrant a, an, a, an investigation is, um, I guess, the history of the headache, obviously, but also the nausea as well. So it's using the PPI sort of daily um, because of that nausea worsening. I guess you're starting to think about like ICP um, because of METs, you know, increasing that pressure um, and causing headaches and then the nausea as well. Um, so I guess that's the key here. And, you know, I guess for GP questions, you always want to, it's not necessarily about what's um, definitely the correct diagnosis, but you just got to rule out these kind of things as well. So uh, that's why um, the answer is B in this case. Um, so, yeah. Alrighty. Um, again, most people got it right, but a little bit of a split. Um, so I guess the key here, so yes, you've got a, you've got a sudden onset um, of reduced vision. Um, I guess the keys to knowing why the answer is B, um, it's kind of buzzwordy and spot diagnosis again, but the cherry red spot um, and then sort of that description of pallor is all kind of, you know, leading you towards that idea of like ischemia, reduced blood flow, um, and hence artery occlusion. So I guess with the the cherry red spot, it's it's basically that the um, it's become so pale and that you can kind of like see through it, and that's what you're seeing there. Um, also, you've got a past history of like past heart attack, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, so all kind of risk factors for um, artery occlusion as well. Um, so just again, a bit of a spot diagnosis. In terms of the the next most common is retinal detachment. Um, I guess it can present similarly with like the sudden onset vision loss um, and like that sort of description of a curtain, I suppose, but you wouldn't get the same picture on, on the fundoscopy. Um, it's sort of hard to describe. So if you haven't seen it, just look up what that looks like because it looks very different to this.
All righty, cool. So most people got this one again. Um, this is another sort of common theme of GP questions where you get like this description of symptoms, a long list of medications, and then it sort of asks you which medication would cause these symptoms. So um, this is sort of an example of digoxin sort of toxicity or um, adverse effects. Um, I don't really have a better explanation of like why these things happen other than it just does. Um, so just one to be aware of if you haven't seen this before, now you know, like it's very, this is very classical how they'll describe it with the confusion and um, vomiting and then these green halos um, in their vision. Like it's all very classic for digoxin. So um, just one to be aware of if you haven't seen it before. Alrighty. So a bit of a split. Um, so I guess in this day, in this stem, most people have correctly identified that it's a melanoma. Um, I guess you can see looking at the photo, it's quite irregular. The color and the shape is not uniform. So those are all signs that it's a melanoma rather than just a normal navus. Um, but in terms of the difference between nodula and lentigo, so nodular sort of in the name is a little bit more raised um, as you can, it's sort of a little bit hard to appreciate in this photo, but you can, you can sort of say that that's not completely flat. Um, but the, the key for Lentigo is, uh, it's, it's also yeah more commonly flat, but it's often has head and neck involvement. And for like a question, it will definitely be like on the face. They wouldn't give you one that isn't, um, and more commonly in the elderly as well. So I guess in this stem, you know, the patient being 70 years old, um, doesn't really help you too much, but the fact that it's on the trunk um, basically will rule out lentigo, at least for the purposes of like a Monash exam. Um, so yeah, the answer would be A. Um, so yeah. Alrighty, so a bit of a split again here. Um, so this STI is an STI screen in another um, important GP topic. So we'll talk about this one. Um, so here you've got uh, a male who's, uh, so I guess when you, when you think about screening for STIs, the easiest way to think about it is like any part of the body that's involved 
in the sex needs to be tested. So if you just send off a urine, then you're sort of obviously missing the other parts that involve. So it says in the stem that there's also oral and anal sex. So you need to be testing those areas. So hence the anorectal and oral swabs for uh, gonorrhea and chlamydia as well. Now, the fact that uh, in this case, you have um, a man who has sex with other men, then you that increases their risk for um, some other sort of bloodborne diseases. So you have to test for those too. So hence you do the serology for HIV, hepatitis and syphilis. So that's the correct answer there. So I guess for the reason B is incorrect for those who've put urethral swab for um, the herpes simplex virus. The key here again, similar to a previous question that is we're screening here. So there's no symptoms and there's no signs of herpes. So you would do a swab if there was actually something to swab, but if there's nothing there, then that's not a useful test. So that's why the answer is A and not B. So you'd only swab if in the stem it said there was also, you know, a rash or there was lesions around the urethral meatus or something like that. Um, but in this case, that wasn't the case. So it's just A. Alrighty. Um, so cool. So most of you got this one correct. So I guess the key takeaway from this, this question, which is why I included it is having an understanding, I guess, firstly of like bowel cancer screening, and that is quite important for GP, but also an understanding of what actually counts as significant family history. So in this stem, you've got a 38 year old patient whose mother was diagnosed at the age of 77. So that does not count as significant at increasing their risk for for the patient for their um for bowel cancer so i'm pretty sure any family history over the age of 50 you wouldn't count as um sort of significant in the sense that they would put their children at higher risk so in this case you actually just go ahead with normal bowel cancer screening like the rest of the population for this patient and in this case um the first step is the um fobt that people get in the mail um, previously you've might've seen that it was at 50, but it's been reduced to 45 years now. So that's why the answer is C. Um, whereas a colonoscopy would only be indicated if the FOBT for this patient was positive at 45, not, um, just based off the family history alone. So that's the key for this question.
All righty. So most people got a bit, a bit of a split again. So um, another medication question. Um, and this time we had some blood results and I'm sure most of you identified the only abnormality was hyperkalemia. So potassium of 5.7 is just above the normal limits. Uh, so in this case, you have to understand uh, firstly, like what all the medications are and then what their side effects are and how they might interact with uh, the electrolytes. So statins, as far as I'm aware, there's no common electrolyte derangement. Um, similarly with the a beta blocker, not commonly. So you've kind of, and most of you were between C and D. So I guess uh, the key understanding is what does furosemide or an ACE inhibitor do to potassium? So most of you identified that ACE inhibitors can raise your potassium, hence why D was a correct answer. For those who put C, uh, furosemide actually reduces your potassium. Um, and I guess if you're ever in an exam and you, you can't quite remember, just think of potassium sparing diuretic, so spiro. So if that's potassium sparing, then I guess you can assume that the other diuretics are not potassium sparing. So furosemide, you lose potassium. So you get the other kind of result. Awesome. So pretty straightforward question. So um, this is a, a stem of a simple UTI. Um, so in this case, it's just about understanding like what's the empirical antibiotics for that. So if you looked it up on ETG, you'd find the answer to be trimethoprim. Um, so yeah, we won't spend too much time on this because most of you got it right. Awesome. Most of you got this one correct as well. Um, a bit of a spot diagnosis. If you look at the audiogram and you see a backwards tick, then um, it's going to, the answer is always uh, pressed by QSIS. But I guess just understanding like you have an older patient, it's bilateral, previously worked in a factory, like it's all sort of leaning towards that age related hearing loss. Um, I guess for the other options, so A, um, you'd expect sort of signs of infection. B would be unlikely to be bilateral and D would probably make itself known before 70 um, and not be more limited to the higher uh, frequency sounds. So yeah, but it's a very classic audiogram. So if you ever see this again, you'll know what the answer is.
Awesome. So mo again, most people got this one right. Um, I guess the, the MSK questions in GP are actually normally pretty straightforward and they're not trying to trick you. So in this case, the sort of mechanism, the, the mechanism of injury and then pain along the medial joint line, it's all sort of pointing to medial meniscus. So, um, but yeah, just sort of have in the back of your mind how the different kind of knee um, soft tissue injuries present. Cause I think out of all the MSK, that's probably one of the more common questions to come up. Alrighty, nearly everyone got it right. This is a very classical stem, um, so I'm not really going to go through it, but just be aware of how these all differentiate in terms of their presentation. I guess that's the key, but this one is very classical. Um, so yeah, I think we've got some more questions along similar lines, so I won't explain too much more. All righty, cool. Most people got this one as well. Uh, the key learning point for this question is just understanding that with vasovagals, you can actually get some um, sort of like abnormal movements and the tonic-clonic contractions. So I guess the key to understanding is that if you see a question where they mention tonic-clonic, like you don't automatically just go, oh, it must be a seizure because uh, it can actually happen with just a simple vasovagal as well. Uh, and the rest of the stem is very classic for that. Else. 
All righty. Um, again, a pretty straightforward question, but another one just to definitely be aware of. So in this case, unlike a previous question where I was talking about high cholesterol, we've got the high triglycerides um, and the medication used to treat that is the, the fibrate. So phenofibrate is the classic. So um, there's no other tricks this question, but it's just being aware that that's the medication that you'd use. Uh, so most of you um, are aware of that already. Whereas like statins or azetamibes or anything else, that's more for the cholesterol. But in this case, it's that isolated uh, raised triglyceride. So yeah, use the fibrates. That actually happened to me when I started work at the hospital I'm at, like before bed. I, my immunity to hepatitis, had, like I had to get a, like a whole new course, you know, so low. That was what, I think it needed to drop something. Yeah, I think it does, but still. Yeah, I didn't get a blood test, but I didn't get a blood test. go up. Okay, cool. Another very classic STEM um of that ex like external ear pain and the fullness in the canal um and the surfer like a risk factor so yeah won't go through this one very straightforward um and most of you got it right Alrighty, another pretty classic stem that most people got correct. So that's good. Um, I guess in, in this one, um, that sort of sudden onset of vertigo with the other symptoms kind of is means A is less likely. Um, and in terms of many years, I guess I was taught like remembering DVT as an acronym, so like deafness, vertigo, tinnitus. Um, and yeah, so it's got all of those in this stem. So yeah, another classic stem, just again, make sure you're aware of how these present and how they're different. Alrighty, so most people got this one right. Um, the key learning point 
uh, from this question. The reason we included it is just understanding um, that when you see sort of like an STI question and they mention like profuse discharge, that you should be leaning towards gonorrhea over chlamydia. Um, it's very like classic for like a Monash question. The profuse discharge is gonorrhea, not chlamydia. Uh, in terms of real life, it might be a bit different, but for the purposes of uh, exams, if you see that, think gonorrhea. Alrighty. Um, I actually don't even know. I guess the key for, so in this uh, STEM, you've got a patient who's got acne um, and they've tried the over-the-counter um, peroxide and it's not really working. So I guess the next step up is um, topical retinoids. Um, in, I think it's just something to really know how likely it is to come up. I'm not sure. Um, I'll just see what the derm people who wrote this question put. Just bear with me a moment. Um, I guess in terms of option A, that can also be used in severe acne, but it would only really be used once other um, therapies have all failed because it does have quite severe um, adverse effects, is my understanding. Uh, and then in terms of the pill that can be used as well. Um, but I think it's that it presents character like more classically with like inflammatory papules and cystic lesions, according to the Derm Society. Um, so, yeah, I guess and antibiotics, what have they put here? Um, they're not as common for the common donal acne that this patient presents with. So, um, this one was a bit of a harder question, but, um, I guess good just to know what the different, um, management options for acne are. And if you're still not sure, maybe something just to read up on, uh, before the exam. That was quite fast. Sorry, everyone. Um, so the vast majority of people who were able to answer got this one correct. Um, so very sort of classic um, sort of like sun damage to the skin causes these um, this sort of presentation, I suppose. Um, I guess in terms of why the other options are incorrect. So for B, they're more pigmented. So that'd be so more to like brown in color where we're sort of looking it's so this is not the best photo apologies but yeah it's sort of these light sort of red pinky kind of scaly lesions and then in terms of like a squamous cell carcinoma you wouldn't expect it to be so spread it would be more like one lesion um i guess same for a bcc as well again a bit of a spot diagnosis
Awesome. So most of you got this one correct. Um, so I guess a key learning from this question is just understanding that psoriasis doesn't always present with that classic um, sort of picture, but there are some other subtypes and this is one to be aware of. Uh, very classic, that widespread um, rash post like ERTI. Um, I guess it can be confused with the um, pityriasis rosea, which we had a question on earlier. But I guess the difference here is that there's no herald patch in this situation. And this one is also classically like post ERTI. But yeah, most of you got this one right. So well done. Awesome. Uh, again, most people got this one right. So in this case, you've got a patient who had a sore throat, given some antibiotics and then developed a rash. So very classic for EBV, um, hence why B is the correct answer. Um, yeah, not really too much else to add, but yeah, just understanding um, that the yeah the, what this test is and why it's used, uh, I guess is important. But yeah, again, a bit of a buzzword here. Alrighty. Um, again, most people got this one. Uh, I guess some of the keys to this question is you've got a slower, like a more gradual sort of longer history. So two months of slowly increasing sort of deafness and associated with the tinnitus as well, um, but not reporting vertigo. So if we actually look at what the options are, um, we already spoke about how B and C sort of present, um, you know, very classically firstly vertigo, but they're sort of sudden onset and then they might resolve after a short period. So this sort of two month history is not really classic for those. Um, and then also the hearing loss findings with um, the Renee's and Weber's test as well um, is sort of showing uh, that sort of hearing loss on the left side, um, which can occur with the acoustic neuroma as well. Um yeah, so I guess the other thing with D, why that's not the answer is um, it doesn't really classically cause hearing loss because the vest the vestibular itself is associated with like the balance and the vertigo. So the labyrinthitis or that's the one that can be more commonly causing the hearing loss. But in this case, um, that's not an option. So you can kind of rule those out because of this hearing loss. Um, yeah, having an understanding of how Renee and Weber's like just make sure you're across 
the difference between the two tests and what the findings mean. It can be one of those ones you kind of have to sit and think about it for a bit, um, but just a good reminder to uh, revise those as well. Alrighty, so most people got this right. Um, I guess, yeah, in this question, so we sort of just spoke about basically all all of these diagnoses already, um, but the key to this one is that the further history reveals he had a cold for the past few days. So the neuronitis is, it's like a phenomena that occurs like with a viral illness, um, yet inflammation of the vestibular and that can cause the vertigo. Um whereas we've already discussed some of the others. So I guess here it did say it happened suddenly after getting out of bed, but it, it didn't sort of indicate that it was with like moving or anything like that that might be suggestive of BPPV. Um, and when you see that sort of viral history in the stem, you can be pretty rest assured about uh, neuronitis. All right, interesting. Um, this is a very classic GP question. Uh, so a good one for you guys to be aware of. Um, so in this case, you've got um, basically this stem is showing like a radicular pain. So you've got this sort of history of back pain after um, some exertion uh, associated with, um, you know, those tests which sort of exacerbate that radiculopathy. Um and you've got some sort of sensory loss as well. So this is all really classic. Um, I guess Monash really do love to test this, that um, this sort of scenario, there is no worrying or like red flag features that would make you want to uh, do in it, any investigations. It's the kind of thing that um, you sort of will wait a few weeks, so hope like, you know, give them conservative management and then, um, and like physiotherapy is really important here. And then, you know, if it, if it per persists for a long time, then you might look to do a scan. I guess the reason that is, um, and I'm sure you guys are aware of this already, but if you were to do a bunch of MRI spines on the general population, you would see a, a large proportion of patients who have, um, um, Ab like abnormalities in their nerve roots, but it doesn't necessarily correlate clinically. So not all of those patients will have 
um, symptoms like these. So then the question is, if we did a scan on this guy and he did have a nerve impingement, then we're not necessarily sure that it wasn't already there before um, what happened the two days prior. So it's not really a significant finding. Um, so I guess in this case, yeah, you, you wouldn't do any investigations. You'd be clinically you're sort of aware and then um, conservative management, physiotherapy, that kind of thing. And then um, what you'll be looking for is red flag features. So things that might, they might add in where you would consider doing a, a scan. So the classic one they would add is um, issues with like bowels or bladder. So commonly, I guess like, you know, for um, like commonly it's like that sort of incontinence, but actually more commonly urinary retention happens before uh, incontinent. So they might throw something like that in. And then I guess other red flags would be things like worsening neur neurology. So in this case, we have some sensory loss, but if, if it was, you know, initially sensory loss and then also involved, you know, motor, motor weakness, and then you had a loss of reflexes as well. And the sensory loss is spreading. It was all sort of worsening. Then you'd be starting to be more concerned, but based off the information in this stem alone, there's no indication currently for imaging. Um, so yeah, it's kind of just, this is quite an important sort of concept to be aware of. Um, and they probably, it's not unlikely that it would come up on the exam. So yeah, make sure um, you review like your red flag causes of back or red flags in back pain and understand sort of when you would investigate and when you wouldn't. Alrighty. Uh, most people got this one correct. Um, I guess the key understanding is just knowing that um, sort of like that ladder for asthma management and COPD as well uh, for GP. Um, so in this case, you've got a patient who's already on um, an ICS and a SABA and they've got sort of ongoing symptoms that sort of are reasonable to consider further management for. Um, so in this case, the next sort of step upwards is adding that LABA as well. Um, I guess. Yeah, I think it's just, yeah, if you're not sure in terms of why it's D and not B, I think that's just the way it's sort of explained on the, um, like those asthma guidelines. Um, but yeah, happy. If people are still unsure, I, I, I can look it up and we can discuss at the end, but maybe for time, we might just keep moving on. Uh, but yeah, just make sure you review those kind of things.
Alrighty. Uh, most people got this one correct. So um, I guess the key for this station and for your learning with diabetic management in terms of like the orals is um, understanding which ones cause weight loss as opposed to weight gain. And then from their understanding uh, which ones might cause dysuria. So in this situation, the SGLT2 inhibitors, because they um, they act by sort of increasing glucose secretion in the urine, that does predispose for infection. So hence the dysuria and it can cause weight loss. It is one of those ones. Um, so that's why the answer is D, uh, which most of you got correct. Um, whereas like B would actually more commonly cause weight gain and the DPB4 inhibitors, as far as I'm aware, wouldn't cause dysuria. Um, in terms, just back to the previous question, um, we just double check the guidelines. So you would add a LABA before increasing your dose of ICS. And basically be, just because any high dose steroid can come with complications, even if it is just inhaled. So you'd rather add another agent before having to increase uh, the dose of a steroid. Alrighty, uh, most people got this one correct. And another classic station, so a uh, stem, sorry. So statins very common, well, not very commonly, but can commonly cause uh, myalgias, so the muscle pains. Um, and just like, I guess, a tip for uh, exam questions, even if you're not sure of the adverse effects of different medications, in the stem, it's told you the patient has just had... Um, an uh, MI and then was discharged on new medication. So if you know what medications might be given to someone after having an MI, you can answer this question without knowing what causes muscle pain because B, C, and D are unlikely to be prescribed for a, for an MI, whereas a statin definitely would be. So it's just a good like technique, I guess, if you're not sure um, of the adverse effect, but you know the indications, that can help as well. We only have two questions left, so you're doing very well. Awesome. Um, almost everyone got this one correct. Another is, again, this is just something you just need to know. There's no really way to remember it, but yes, yeah, Spiro can uh, cause the gynecomastia um, and would be prescribed for someone with a new diagnosis of heart failure. So, yeah.
<laughs> Alrighty. Uh, again, most people got this one correct. So uh, this stem is pretty classic for BPH. Um, I guess you're not worried about cancer because it sort of mentions the uniform enlargement and then there's no sort of like other symptoms like weight loss or night sweats and that kind of thing. Um, in terms of managing that, uh, obviously it's just like with anything, you start with your lifestyle, then pharmacotherapy, and then you would leave sort of surgical intervention last. So in this case, we've tried lifestyle, it's not working. So hence we wouldn't jump straight for TERP. Um, uh, and then D would only really be for cancer. And even then it's questionable. So I guess you're left between A and B. Um, and as I'm sure most of you are aware, B sort of acts on the alpha receptors to help um, sort of dilate the um, the urethra and help with um, the ur passing of urine. Whereas the um, oxybutynin is acts on like the acetylcholine and that's actually used more for urge incontinence. So it wouldn't be indicated in this setting. All right, that was the last question. So we'll see our podium. What on HZ and CCW and boop. Good job, everyone. I might pass to Emil. Thank you again to um, Bailey for from GPCN and Bonin as well. Um, they also created some more questions today to uh, make up for the time that we were running early. Um, just wanted to say everyone at the end of this long day, thanks so much for coming. And I hope you all had a, um, you know, efficient day of revision and that this was useful for you. I'm going to be sharing all of the slides to the questions after uh, probably later today, as well as the recording. Um, so say, stay tuned to the Facebook page for that. Um, and also, um, as you're leaving, uh, feel free to take any leftover pizza in the left hand like corner of the room. And also please uh, take any rubbish you brought in with you. Um, but yeah, thanks all so much for coming. And I'll just be putting a feedback form in the Facebook group as well. If you have any feedback for this new format that we've been using. Thanks everyone.